afternoon to all our distinguished guests, dignitaries, participants, and my dear friends. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the first International Forensic Science e-conference 2021. I can feel the energy as I speak, as the event is just, just not limited to the exchange of knowledge, but it is an event filled with surprises. So prepare to be amazed. I promise you that this is going to be an event you all will remember. We are looking forward to your comments, views on the presentations of our experts and also the questions. But wait, there is even more. The best comments in the comment section will be getting a big surprise filled with memories to take away. Let the energy you at the event start now. Waste much time. Event proceeding. So stay till the end. It's going to be a journey filled with surprises, knowledge, and memories. A very good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all our distinguished guests, dignitaries, participants, and my dear friends. I Ashika. I Nandini. Welcome you all to the first day of first ever International Forensic Science e conference on empowering forensic sciences. This first ever e conference is powered by the Forensic Corner and organized by the students of National Forensic Sciences University, India. Before we kickstart the conference, we would like to express our gratitude to National Forensic Sciences University for supporting and guiding us for the event with the experience and expertise. We are grateful to learn under such great experts. Without your support, this event would not have been possible. Moreover, we are also extremely grateful to the International Scientific Experts Panel who have thoroughly supported the organizing team of the Forensic Corner and they have added glory to the event with their esteemed presence. We are very fortunate to have amongst us our National Forensic Sciences University Vice Chancellor Sir, Dr. J.M. Vyas Sir, Campus Director Dr. Esso Janare Sir and our Dean Dr. Dharmesh Silajia Sir we are really blessed to have you all, sir. With utmost pleasure and pride, we are very much excited to acquaint you that we are very fortunate to have amongst us in the meeting many reputed national and international personalities in the field of forensics from India, Germany, USA, Zimbabwe, Bahrain, and overseas. We are blessed with your esteemed presence, respected sirs and maps. As we all know that in this modern age where crime is advancing at a faster edge, there's a huge need and requirement of the trained experts and personas who are highly trained and skilled in the field of forensic sciences. Therefore, establishing an institute solely dedicated to the forensic sciences was of utmost importance. With this vision and mission in mind, the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, proposed the idea of establishing the first ever worldwide institute solely dedicated to the forensic sciences. The Honorable Prime Minister has himself said that justice will be delivered by the forensic science officials as they are the most res as, they are, as they are the most responsible persons who know how to deal properly with the evidence and avoid its tampering. Our Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, Dr. J.M. Vyas Sir, was the pioneer in establishing the world's first forensic sciences university at Gandhinagar, Gujarat in 2009. The university has been elevated as a central university with the status of institution of national importance on 1st of October 2020. The university has more than 2,500 students and conducts 50 specialized postgraduate degree and diploma courses besides PhD and DSC programs. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now take you to the field which is full of enthusiasm, thrill and excitement. It gives me immense pleasure to be here in front of the most esteemed personalities who have won accolades in their respective fields. One such great personality we have amongst us is Honorable Dr. J.M. Vyas Sir, Dr. J.M. Vyas Sir is the Founder Vice Chancellor of National Forensic Sciences University, which is a central university and institution of national importance under the Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. He is also holding the additional charge of Director General, Directorate of Forensic Science, Gandhinagar, Gujarat, India. He is the senior most scientist of the country 
and possesses vast and rich experience of 48 years in the forensics domain. That includes 27 years of service as head of the Forensic Science Laboratory, Gujarat, India. He has been instrumental in, in introducing many innovative investigation technologies and best practices, which are still being followed in many central and state forensic laboratories. He has contributed immensely with his domain expertise in forensics, and he has been a part of various expert committees. The Ministry of Railways, Government of India, appointed him as the member of the Task Force for Railway Safety Audits. He was also appointed as a consultant to CBI New Delhi for the establishment of International Center of Excellence in Forensic Science, Ghaziabad. He remained as a member of the organizing committee Interpol for the three consecutive terms, that is 2008 to 2010, 2011 to 2013, and 2014 to 2016. He has also been a part of the governing council of many reputed bodies that include member of governing council of Association of Indian Universities, AIU, New Delhi, and member of governing council of Indian Council of World Affairs, ICWA, New Delhi, that is headed by Honorable Vice President of India. He is also a member of governing council of International Institute of Digital Technology, IIDT Tirupati, that is headed by Honorable Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh. He was invited by Parliamentary Standing Committee on Science and Technology, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Rajya Sabha Secretariat, Parliament of India, as a subject matter expert for giving his views on various provisions of DNA Technology Regulation Bill 2019. The contribution of Dr. J.M. Vyasa in the forensics domain has been recognized at national as well as international level, and he has received many prestigious awards. Several international awards received by him are Distinguished International Forensic Scientist Award in recognition of leadership and excellence in forensic science and education in the international community by the Henry C. Lee Institute of Forensic Science University of New Haven, West Haven, USA, in October 2018. Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Field of Forensics and Investigative Sciences by International Association of Police Academics, Turkey, on 11th February, 2019. Humanitarian Forensic Award in recognition of exceptional services in the field of humanitarian forensics by International Center for Humanitarian Forensics on 5th September, 2019. Various national awards that he has been honored by are President's Police Medal for meritorious services on the eve of Republic Day in the year 1997, Best Forensic Science Laboratory Director of the Country in 2004, Lifetime Achievement Award in the area of Forensic Chemistry by Amity University Uttar Pradesh, and All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, in October 2008. Bharat Mata Award by Indian Institute of Oriental Heritage in 2014. Dr. J.M. Vyas Sir has written many research papers in the areas of forensic sciences, which have been published in the reputed journals. He has contributed significantly in the infrastructure and capacity building of the university with this vision foresight and domain expertise. Within a short span of time, National Forensic Sciences University, formerly known as Gujarat Forensic Sciences University, has acquired a premier place in forensics education on the global map and is promoting forensics to make the world a safer and a better place to live. With this, I would like to request our keynote speaker, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. J.M. Das, sir, to address this event with his kind words of wisdom and to enlighten us with his thoughts. Over to you, sir. I'm sorry, my voice was not, uh, yeah, it was. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able. To. First of all, first of all, I would like to congratulate my dear students for taking this lead in organizing this unique international conference in the field of forensic science. Very important. You see, I am not uh, exaggerating, but to organize a conference is not a job. We have been trying. I must have organized a large number of conferences. Then you have to boil your blood. And there are many issues which come in there. And therefore, many times, people don't take that uh, uh, decision of organizing a conference, considering various amount of obstacles which come your way when you do this. But at this age, when you are only studying, you could take this decision. And I'm sure you are going to handle it in the most successful manner. So my congratulations and best wishes to all of you. And my congratulations also, also to Dr. Raki because it was her leadership, her initiative, which motivated the students. And they came out with his idea, which I supported. I immediately said, yes, you do it. And we must do it. And this is how this conference is being organized. I am very happy that this is a very good initiative. And this is not only going to give education and knowledge to the students and others who don't know about forensics in a total manner, but this will also give a kind of an international exposure to this university also because I have been told that large number of international participants have joined this conference. So it's a very good step bringing, because this is a very small uh, Paternity, if you see, which is a small community of forensic scientists in the world. We are not many. And to bring them together, exchange their views, understand their idea regarding expansion of forensics, utility of forensics, etc., will be very, very educative, not only to the students, not only to the participants, even a person like me. I will also get educated that, yes, we should do it. So this is a very good step, exemplary step. And once again, I congratulate and thank my students for taking this lead. <laughs> now coming back to this forensic conference. See, forensic conferences were organized by Government India, MHA, once in a year. Then it was a biennial conference. And then after this university was established, we also organized three, four conferences of international level. The purpose of, as I told in the beginning, is to bring all the forensic science scientists under one umbrella. We can know each other because we belong to the same family. So we know that, yes, he is a person who is doing excellent work in UK. He is a person who is doing excellent work in US, etc. So we all come together. And... What I wish is we should form a, a, a kind of a small family group, small association of forensic scientists of the entire globe. And then under that uh, umbrella, we can start uh, organizing this kind of conferences every year. So that also is a good step. Now, if you take forensic science, it's a multidisciplinary area. Because you can't depend on one, one, one area or one kind of expertise in handling varieties of investigations. See, when I joined forensic department about 48 years ago, I was only a chemist, basically. And then when I started performing my actions as a forensic scientist, I was given a level of forensic scientist. And then if you take me, I was only a chemist. But then people look at me as a forensic scientist and anything happening in this area, people expect that I should come forward and give my opinion. And I was an expert only of chemistry. So chemistry related, if investigations are there, then I, I was able to handle them successfully. I was able to justify everything, whatever was done by me. But if suppose there is an investigation where a deep knowledge of biology is required. There is an investigation where you need a, a level of good, good level of biotechnology. There is an expertise required in handling toxicological related cases. There is expertise required in 
identifying the was based on waste spectrograph is a physical examination there is a there is a requirement of comparing two glass pieces whether they belong to the same uh, origin or not to examine the soil of two different places whether they are the same or they are different so multiple actions and multiple activities now you can't expect from a chemist person doing all this he may do it but that efficiency will not be there that expertise will not be there so this is how forensic scenario started people with basic qualifications were recruited after some years scenario little bit, little was improved little bit and then we started the programs many universities in india <coughs> uh, bsc in forensic science and msc in forensic science now here also when you do go for B msc forensic science say again take my example i did my bsc with chemistry now i opt for msc in forensic science now again i will be interested in learning topics which belong to my expertise so i will concentrate more on chemistry part and then some other subjects will be taught to me just to give me some idea as to what is this forensic science and what are the other expertise areas of expertise where you need to know you need to understand and this crime scenario is such that no single expert can handle all kinds of crimes which are happening and the latest advancement is cyber crime where you know that even even the physics person chemistry person even a biologist you are not able to handle you need a different kind of expertise you need some engineers in some cases you need digital forensic experts in some so this is how scenario went on changing so after a few years then we got an opportunity to establish world's first university in the field of forensic science in the year 2009 then we examined this the position of education in the country and the world and the requirement of law enforcement agencies what they want from forensic experts so again the a general forensic scientist with a background of bsc in chemistry with a background of bsc in microbiology with a background in bsc in biotechnology with a background of bsc in physics now this kind of a person when he comes out with a qualification of msc forensic science again he is a person with a general knowledge with limited expertise of his own area which he had done in in bsc level he is a chemist so he is normally work asked to work in chemistry department or chemical related investigation in forensic science laboratory a person who has passed out bsc with physics normally we put him in physics department to handle and he has learned some little bit more physics as a forensic physics as part of their total syllabus of forensic science now he is neither an expert in his own physics because he was not given a total exposure he was given a little bit exposure of physics when he did his msc in forensic science because msc forensic science you need to cover 14 15 subjects so you can't give concentration to only physics which was my area in in when i passed out from bsc so that was again an issue so then we came out with a new mechanism and that was also probably the first time in the world we said we will give specialization we don't want now general forensic scientist general forensic science will be taught to the students in the first year and then second year we give the option if is a student of physics a specialization in physical forensic sciences if the student is chemist specialization in forensic chemical sciences and is a biologist specialization in forensic biological examination so this is how we divided this expertise into three groups and then again there was a demand of digital forensics so we came out with the fourth expertise the fifth one was handwriting and question document which doesn't belong to any basic group but then you need special kind of expertise in dealing with this kind of cases where you need to identify somebody's signatures you need to identify the genuineness of the question documents which are submitted to you now this is slightly you are molding your knowledge of chemistry physics etc 
in handling this kind of cases. So we also started giving specialization in handwriting or doc document examination and also fingerprint. So these are the areas where some kind of specialization was required. And this option is given to the student after the student passes the first year. Now we started getting experts which have got, who have got some, some kind of expertise. <clears throat> could be in biotechnology, could be in fingerprint, could be in handwriting, likewise. That also, when the time passed, we realized that this kind of expertise is also we give only for one year. Two, out of two years master's program, the students are taught general forensics in first year. Second year, the student is given education in a specialized area of the selection of the student. That also, we felt, does not give total picture or does not give a total spectrum of investigation in a particular area as far as the student is concerned. So then in certain niche areas, we started two years program itself. It could be MSc in forensic chemistry, MSc in forensic toxicology, all two years you are taught only toxicology, nothing else. MSc forensic biotechnology, MSc digital forensics, MSc cybersecurity, MSc forensic pharmacy, MSc forensic dentistry, M uh, PG diploma in forensic nursing, then MTech in uh, MSc, uh, MTech in uh, forensic engineering. Likewise, we thought, let us come out with specialization where student is able to concentrate do, uh, both the years, the specialized area the student has selected. <coughs> Little bit of exposure on forensic science and the student is taught toxicology the entire period of two years. Little bit of forensics and the student is taught digital forensics throughout the year, both, both the years. This is how we are changing the scenario of education in the field of forensic science. Whosoever comes out now comes out with great level of expertise. Now the person knows he has gained expertise in toxicology. So the students go for, a, go for a PhD in the same field. So this fellow is PhD in toxicology. He studied toxicology in master's level. And then he did PhD in toxicology. So now you can understand the person who is coming out with this kind of qualifications has got total expertise in that particular field. So this is the requirement. So we have to mold our mode of education as per the requirement of stakeholders. We can't stick to this. No, you can't go this. There was some criticism. How can you give specialization, etc. initially when we launched this? Because none of the universities in India was going for this kind of specialization. And now even the forensic laboratories are asking because they need experts. They don't, they don't need general forensic scientists. They say, we would like to have experts who have studied in some specialized area. If the, the student has studied biotechnology, then the FSL experts, FSL director, et cetera, they want the student to be admitted in a biotechnology department. So straight away, the student who has got a lot of exposure in this starts taking up cases related to DNA fingerprinting. So this is how we are changing the scenario. and see that we provide the best education, high quality education, quality of international level to our students who join this university. So in fact, if you come, then what is the role of a forensic scientist? Comes to our mind. Now this role, according to me, which I have defined, it starts with, crime scene management. So a forensic scientist's job starts with a crime scene management. The person visits crime scene, collects important, identifies important clues which are lying at the scene. There could be anything. So he identifies that, yes, this is a good clue which will help me in connecting the criminal with, uh, with the crime scene based on this important evidence which is lying at the scene. 
So he's identifying and then he also knows proper method of collection. He can't touch with his hands. He has two hands, hand gloves. So every evidence is to be very minutely examined on the spot and then minutely with all kinds of precision accuracy to see that it doesn't get contaminated is to be lifted. And then some of the evidences are such, especially biological evidences, they get decomposed, degraded. So you also have a method of preserving such evidences. So he identifies, picks up the evidences, and if required, he preserves them. And he also knows the procedure of referring this evidences which he has collected to the forensic lab. So role number one is crime scene management. Now, role number two is detailed examination of the clues which the expert has collected from the scene of offense. Now, here you need a, a very good expertise of funding this kind of evidence. And this evidence could belong to any area. And this evidence is, could be of any type, of any nature. For example, it could be hair, it could be blood, it could be semen. It could be perspiration. It could be saliva. When you talk of biological evidences, it could be specs. It could be CD. It could be TV. It could be DVD. It could be hard disk. It could be mobile. It could be soil. It could be paint. It could be glass pieces. It could be even a broken button of a shirt because there was a scuffle where some of the buttons were lost by the accused and he ran away. So it button. So even it could be pen, it could be a bottle, it could be gun, either a pistol or revolver, anything, a firearm, it could be ammunition. So you don't have control. These are all varieties of evidences which are lying at the scene of offense, which have been referred to forensic uh, detail examination. Now, depending on the nature of the exhibit, you divide them. If it is related to body fluid or body material, you refer these samples to biology department. If they are of physical in nature, you need physics expertise of physical uh, forensic sciences. So refer to them. And in physical forensic sciences also, again, there are departments. You have digital forensics, you have voice identification system department, you have a department where you deal with fake currency or genuine currency examination. There is also a department where you deal with glass, soil, etc. And the sixth department, physics, can have is ballistics, where you undertake examination of firearm, etc. So depending on this, the head of the institution takes a decision that this evidences can be referred to this particular department. So you can imagine one crime, one crime scene, collection of various evidences going to multiple places based on the level of expertise available. They are not referred to general forensic scientists, but then they are referred to different sections where they have got expertise specifically in this area. Now, what is the forensic laboratory? What is what is this? What do you mean by detail examination? Yeah. Now, as I said, evidence could be anything. It's not in your hand. A, a, a glass lying at the scene of offense could not be an evidence. You is cannot be decided by you. When it is lying, it has to provide some information regarding the person who handled the glass. So everything is collected. Now the role of forensic scientist in the laboratory is, or the role of a director or the role of forensic laboratory is to see that they should have all kinds of expertise and the technology required for undertaking evidences of different nature. Everything should be there. If it is a soil, no, I don't have facility for undertaking soil testing. No, you have to. 
paint. There has to be technology available for examination of paint. A CD is given to you. You must have technology to examine CD. The mobile is sent to you. You must have technology to undertake examination of mobile, computer, glass piece, button, everything. Blood, saliva, semen, grouping, origin, F to D and fingerprinting. You must have all the technologies. Ultimately, the job of a forensic scientist working in the forensic lab is to see that by carrying out detailed examination of all these exhibits, are they able to identify the perpetrator of a crime? Because they have got certain evidences which are unique in nature. If they have got an evidence of a voice, based on voice, you identify a person. Based on DNA, again, you identify the person. If you have a fingerprint lifted from the scene of offense, now you are able to directly identify the person. So there are certain technologies which you lead, which lead you to directly identify the perpetrator of a crime. And there are the rest of the technologies which may not be directly indicating that he is a perpetrator, but then they gave a lot of clues, a lot of information to the IO that yes, these, this level of people could be there who could have been involved in this crime. So this is how it is to be done. So some of the methods give direct evidence, some of the methods they give indirect evidence. In, in certain cases, because you may not have the prohibition, etc. In Gujarat, we have prohibition. We get large number of cases where people possess the bottle of liquor and large number of cases where people consume. Now, when the consumption of case comes, the person's blood comes directly for, for detailed examination of alcohol. And even you have to give percentage of alcohol present in the blood. And in Gujarat, the level we have kept is up to 49 milligram percent. There is no uh, offense. When the blood alcohol level reaches 50 milligram percent and above, there is an offense. Now you determine the level, how much alcohol is there in the blood. And this is direct evidence. When a forensic scientist says that this blood sample contained 55 milligram percentage of ethyl alcohol, the man is to be punished. That's all. You don't treat any other evidences. No witnesses are required. Nothing is required. So this evidence of a forensic scientist is taken as a primary evidence. Is a direct evidence. Handwriting examination. Nothing. No witnesses are required. Straight away, if a handwriting expert gives an opinion, these are the handwritings of X. This is a signature done by X. X is identified. You don't require witness. You don't require panchas. Nothing. This was an official document seized by police. And there you are establishing the authorship of the person who has written the document, who has signed the document. Direct evidence. <clears throat> Some of the cases, though it can be taken as a direct evidence, but there are limitations. I give one example, they have it closed because I don't want to bore you more. But say, for example, there is a firing which took place from a gun, particular gun, taking a revolver. Now, a particular revolver X was fired and the person was killed. Now, what you collect from the scene of weapons is a bullet. And your cartridge case remains within the revolver. Now this bullet, which is recovered from the scene or the body of a person, is sent for examination, ballistic examination. Now, expert's job is to see that because this gun is also seized. Whether this bullet, which is recovered from the scene of offense, is fired from this particular gun or not, then it should become a direct evidence. Now, examination was done and you could identify that the gun seized from this particular ex ex accused was used in this firing. That means you are directly pinpointing an accused under whose possession this gun used to be. Now, though this is a direct evidence that this bullet is fired from this gun and the person is killed with this bullet. So everything is clear. Still, however, your opinion as a ballistic expert is secondary in nature. It's not primary. Because you need to prove who was in possession of the gun when the crime took place. 
So you have to depend on witnesses. You need to prove the presence of accused at the scene of offence when the crime took place. Suppose he was not there. He was in, in some other city and the crime took place with his own gun. He cannot be booked. So though your evidence was primary in nature, was direct in nature that yes, he is the owner of the gun and from this particular gun, the firing has been done and the person was killed. Still, however, other corroborative evidence need to be gathered and then you can come to a conclusion that yes, this was his gun, it was under his possession, his presence at the scene of offense when the crime took place is also getting established through mobile location, etc. And then all these evidences ultimately lead to his presence. Then only you can say he is a person who is involved in this murder. And then only conviction can be made. So whatever opinions will give, they vary. Some of the opinions are primary in nature, direct evidence in nature, and some of your opinions are indirect or secondary as far as the evidential value is concerned. This corroboration. So this is how forensic science goes. And then the other thing came was, if suppose there are no evidences, what is the role of forensic science? When you went to the scene, you came to know after three months a crime was committed. After three months, some information came to police where visit the scene. Within three months, everything has been destroyed. Everything has been removed. A lot of rain also is an open space. So things have gone. Now, no evidence. Now, that means forensic scientists cannot do anything because there is no evidence collected. So the question came, can forensic scientists still, however, help the investigating audition in absence of evidences? Then we said yes. And then we came out with a new area called forensic psychology. There, we examine the suspects. We examine the witnesses psychologically. We even examine the complainant, the victim. Everyone who is involved, suspect, is subjected to psychological methods of interrogation. That starts with psychological profiling. Then it goes to initial ALI detector test. Then you have suspect detection test. Then you have layered voice analysis test. Then you also have like a test called brain fingerprinting or different names are given for this. So whatever is stored, you're trying to take out the information. And then ultimately still, you are not able to decide the involvement and the cause of this action. It was what, is the, what was the motive behind committing the murder? If that also is not coming out, then ultimately you go to narco analysis where you induce some drug and is there a drug induced hypnotism. So it is a hypnosis which is done under the influence of drug and then you take out the information for the person. So forensic science now has got this wide variety. There are evidences, there are experts, and the specialized experts who have been trained in this, who are qualified in this particular area, undertakes examinations and give report. If you don't have evidences, a forensic psychologist, they, in absence of evidences, deal with live human beings. Psychology is the only area where you handle live exhibits. All other areas, there are dead, dead exhibits which are referred to forensic laboratory. So this is how these things are differentiated. So you also have the mechanism of a forensic psychological evaluation, evidence and evaluation procedure available within the forensic lab. So when all these areas are covered and you have techno required technology for that, you are required to expertise for that, and you also have credibility, you have sufficient number of experts, you have a good number of technology covering all aspects of crime investigation, then you can say that you are a full-fledged forensic lab with everything. So this is how credibility also is a very, very important area. Well, and that is why there is a subject which is being taught ethical values in forensic investigations. You must have credibility. There should be credibility of the institution where you are working. There should be credibility of an expert. That this expert has given this opinion cannot be wrong. That kind of reputation you need to build. That is credibility. 
it can be lost in a fraction of a second. But then building this credibility takes a lot of time. And that needs to be proved. And you have to pass through many, many examinations, many, many hurdles. Uh, and ultimately, when you reach that level, the credibility gets established automatically. But you remember me, it can go within a fraction of a second. You committed one error and your labor, the pain you took in establishing credibility goes in a fraction of a second. Achieving this takes a huge task, but taking away this or losing this doesn't require any time. So be cautious. See that you get the identification as a credible, dependable forensic expert with who is following all kinds of ethical values. He also has sufficient expertise of the evidence he is dealing with. <clears throat> he has got a mastery in this. He has got even PhD done in this particular subject. And he is given an opinion which has to be accurate because this man has got credibility. And this, this is how courts are convinced and they pass judgments based on this kind of opinion submitted to the court. So this, in short, I gave you the full picture, right from entry of a basic scientist into forensic labs to, to now scenario has changed. You get all kinds of experts of different area. So we are trying to promote forensic science in a big, big way. And through this university, we are helping many, many countries in capacity building in the field of forensic science, in the, in the area of investigation, in the area of security, et cetera. So this is what is done. And this is what our charter is. And so far, as I remember correctly, we have helped around 70 countries of the world in their capacity building process. So this is for huge potential. Now, because the, these criminals are becoming more and more smart, sophisticated, they have better technology than what the investigators have. So you have to keep peace with them. And for doing this, you need support of forensic scientists. So the support, forensic science support based investigation is the need of the hour and everybody looks for it. And therefore, yes, you have to come out with this. People are looking at you, large, a huge requirement. So, and we don't have students, passed out students, people are demanding. So the 100% potential, 100% placement opportunity. They are all getting employed. Now, we, somebody that talked to me about a week back, sir, I need your three, four forensic experts. Can you give me? And when I found out, there was no one, they all students have been absorbed with good, good packages and good salary. So need is increasing, awareness is increasing even in judiciary and in police. Now police also wants forensic experts to come to their help and uh, do the investigation on the spot. Evidences must be collected, report to forensic. Judges are also aware, so they also demand if the IO doesn't go, uh, doesn't go with forensic opinions, etc. Judges are demanding, why did you not involve forensic experts? So this is now a growing area. And I congratulate the students because they selected the right area for making their career, for building their career. And the uh, yeah, sky is the limit. All kinds of experts are required. Just to give an example, digital forensics. The requirement in India is few lakhs against which we have less than 100 experts available. So you can understand what would be the ultimate. So in coming five years, it is going to be increased further. So we are trying to uh, now produce more and more experts. So this is what I wanted to say. I once again thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I wish this uh, conference, though in a virtual board, uh, is, becomes uh, totally successful, meaningful, and fruitful. And people who have attended this, they should go with good level of knowledge, good level of expertise, and they will be able to serve whatever organizations they are working with in a better way with more efficiency, more expertise and more knowledge. So once again, thank you so much. All the best. Thank you so much, sir.
Uh, yeah, I am in session. Sir, Dr. Shlaji, sir, will say something. Yes, sir, sir, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank yes. you very much, sir, thank for giving us your time and sharing your uh, sparking knowledge. Yes, thank you. And this will definitely helpful to the students, the future of forensic science. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I take your leave now. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. Much, sir. With utmost pleasure and pride, let me now take you through the virtual tour of a university and give you a brief recap of our event. Previously, our university was called as Gujarat Forensic Sciences University and now it is called as National Forensic Sciences University. The battle is age old. Good versus evil. Criminal versus law. Terror versus peace. There is someone playing a major role for the establishment of justice and peace. That is science. Forensic science. The horizons of this science are expanding to embark futuristic innovation and development in crime investigation and detection. The government of Gujarat has established a unique university of specialized education with a focus to prepare ready-to-serve industry professionals in the field of forensic science. World's first and only forensic science university. That is Gujarat Forensic Sciences University, popularly known as GFSU, established by the government of Gujarat under the flagship of Home Department is a highly specialized higher education institution across the world which is the only establishment of its kind dedicated to forensic and investigative sciences. Located at Gandhinagar, the capital city of the state of vibrant Gujarat, it has established three major academic institutes namely Institute of Forensic Science, Institute of Behavioral Science an institute of research and development. Collectively, the university offers more than 35 postgraduate and doctorate level academic programs. Besides education and research, the university is also engaged in imparting training to officers of law enforcement agencies of the world. The university runs in parallel association with the Directorate of Forensic Science, DFS Gujarat State, to provide hands-on training the GFSU's ultra-modern campus is spread across an area of 50,000 square meters and new development is taking place at adjoining 74,000 square meters area. GFSU offers state-of-the-art infrastructure facilities like classrooms equipped with projectors, laboratories with latest equipments and instruments, administrative wing, computer lab, multiple R&D laboratories and much more. The GFSU campus is Wi-Fi enabled, centrally air-conditioned and equipped with highly intelligent security systems. This university has established Asia's first and only cyber defense center for education, training and research in the areas of combating cyber war and cyber security. This eco-friendly and green campus has international class hostels and guest house facilities to provide comfortable accommodation to students and guests. An amphitheater, huge playground for multiple sports. Cafeteria, large auditorium with 560 seating capacity. Learning resource center with internet facilities. Together with a voluminous collection of electronic and printed books, journals, paper reviews and articles add in to the list. Among three major academic institutes, the Institute of Forensic Sciences was established with an aim to provide a center for academic excellence and ultra-modern practical training in the area of forensic and its subsidiary sciences. GFSU's ultra-modern ballistics research and testing range has got capabilities of analyzing bulletproof materials like jackets, glass plates, metallic plates, helmets, tires and even armored vehicles. This facility is only of its kind in Asia. The Institute of Behavioral Science endeavors to impart education and research in clinical and forensic psychological sciences and also to provide better caliber in diagnostics, psycho-legal consultations and treatment and rehabilitation to clients. 
Institute of Research and Development is a dedicated center to the discovery, development and application of forensic science in a wide range of academic and professional areas to create excellent quality of research work. Apart from its state-of-the-art research facilities at GFSU and DFS, GFSU also hosts students and police personnel from various parts of the world. The university provides 100% placement assistance and has created a full-fledged placements and career guidance cell. GFSU runs an international affairs cell to assist aspiring and existing international students, which may include overseas police and intelligence officials also. Knowledge Wisdom Fulfillment Education through investigation Gujarat Forensic Sciences University Now we would also like to give a brief recap of our event. Meanwhile, we'll be discussing how and what a layman feels about forensic science. You know, most people ask me, 
that uh, we actually see on the TV crime dramas. Once a piece of evidence has been retrieved, the results of testing will soon follow. What do you think? Uh, what do you think exactly happens in the reality? Well, in the reality, actual testing is a slow and it is a deliberate process that can take weeks or months. Most of the tele most of the television shows, what they have to do is that they have to be completed in the twenty five to forty five minutes. So the results, uh, so the results of their fictional forensic test are back. Uh, they are back on very much quickly. But the rule of the thumb is the more technical the forensic test is, the longer it will take. For example, a run through of the fingerprints can take about few minutes. DNA testing can go for days, even weeks. And certain measures, and hence certain measures, are taken to improve the accuracy of these tests while increasing the time. As these tests must be performed precisely, otherwise the odds of the faulty results uh, are being obtained uh, are being increased. So I have a puzzle for our respected audience. saw him die. I said the fly. With my little eye, I saw him die. So I would request the audience to please tell this puzzle answer in the comment section on our YouTube. I think I we have received the answer. Okay. I guess you should repeat the the audience question. is asking to repeat the question. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Who saw him die? I said the fly. With my little eye, I saw him die. Someone from the chat yeah. box is saying the answer is magnifying glass. Yeah. Is he right? No, he is not right. Let's wait for some other answers. Okay, let me repeat the question once again for the audience. Who saw him die? I said the fly. With my little eye, I saw him die. Okay. okay, so we are getting many camera. answers. Yeah. CCTV camera, magnifying glass, microscope. Yeah, so Abhishek Hawaladar has given a right answer. He's saying forensic entomology. Yeah, Abhishek, uh, it's the right one. Yeah, and someone is saying the blowflies are the best one that saw him die with their little eyes. This is because they're attracted to the blood. Yeah, that's true. Okay, someone is saying eyewitness, diphtheria flies. Okay, we are getting so many answers. Fine. What I feel sometimes, what I feel like, that forensic science is a field that works on your common sense and basic logics. So, Apurva, what do you think? Do you agree? 
I definitely agree with it because being a part of the vicinity, I definitely agree that it definitely works on the basis of common sense because there are many small details on a crime scene that we can find if we apply our sense to it. And if we do not, I guess we can tamper with the clues that are present on the crime scene. So yes, definitely it is. Definitely. Here I can cite one example for the audience as uh, as well, that there was a case pertaining to the death of the individual from the gunshot wounds, which was investigated by Dr. Anil Agarwal, sir. And most of his colleagues were trying to find out the time since death when the individual died. But Anil sir said that the time was 10.30. So most of the people, they were saying, oh, how you can say? They were, they were like, how? They were, they were so much baffled. And so he said that the gunshot, after hitting the person, it struck the clock that uh, that was placed just beside him. And due to that reason, the clock, uh, like he noticed, he was able to notice the time. And then he said, uh, then he said that when you apply the common sense, you can uh, you can uh, solve most of the crimes. Okay. Then uh, let's move on to our next question. Okay. Uh, we have we all have learned about the Locard's exchange principle. That every contact leaves a trace. Right. So, Aburva, can you put some light on this principle? What is Locard's exchange principle? And I would also request our audience to tell uh, that what do they know about the Locard's exchange principle? I guess, should we first see it from the audience? audience? Or else yeah. then I can tell whatever yes, I yes, know yes. about it. Okay, fine. We'll wait for some time. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so Zafira Parmar has said that every contact leaves traces and okay. Himani says when two things are in contact, they leave traces. So basically everyone is right. Um, whatever I know is that there was a French criminologist, Dr. Edmund Locard. So he formulated the basic, very basic pr principle of forensic science that definitely quotes every contact leaves a trace whatever happens is that our body or maybe any object they have certain grooves on the on their surface and whenever they come in contact with, in, with any other object they leave a trace of their identity of their individuality on the other surface so that was the principle that was formulated by dr edmund locard and uh, he is known for like um, he was tagged as a Sherlock Holmes of France and then he has basically worked in the field of forensic sciences and public health so that was a short view of Edmund Lucard principle okay so we are getting good answers on the comment section as well uh, Jia Gupta is messaging that this principle holds that the perpetrator of a crime will bring something into the crime scene and will leave something from uh, it so that was basically the Lucard's exchange principle also, I would, act, uh, I would like to add one more thing that uh, here, Dr. Henry C. Lee, uh, he also proved that DNA is also exchanged from the crime scenes. We can say like the touch DNA. So these are also exchanged from the crime scenes. And uh, so that can be also, that can also act as a very good evidence. Fine. Okay. Most of the people ask me like uh, how we select the groceries when like we never select the groceries while bringing them. So uh, and most of the people will say that what is what how does it matter that we should select the groceries while bringing it or not. So what do you think? Should we select groceries uh, very very much particularly? I have no clue. I go randomly and then pick the groceries. <laughs> I have no clue about it. Okay, fine. So, but I guess, yes, planning must be done. It is a very okay. efficient work. And okay. then obviously it is going to help us. But then okay. if I talk about my personal experiences and I, I don't. Okay. So what I feel according to the, from the toxicologist's perspective that 
most of the many foods they contain poisons and toxins even uh, even the bitter almonds we all have heard that uh, if uh, if an adult consumes 50 almonds 50 bitter almonds then uh, then it can leave some traces of cyanide while for a child it is only for 5 to 10 almonds it is uh, very much fine so we have to see it properly that if the almonds are treated properly or not and all of these things also there are some uh, some foods like you know cherry pits certain mushrooms potatoes uh, and and many more foods i can say that contain the toxins and uh, that can be proved fatal so i would like the audience that if anyone would uh, want to say about uh, these foods uh, which contain poison i think we are receiving an answer that is okay. tatura and that's a right answer by shankar and shankar that's the right answer now before uh, now we are going to start with the national expert talk uh, so ashik i would request you to please continue uh, with the national experts thank you and Kishore. thank you nandini for uh, the uh, puzzle session it was a uh, very good session and okay. people have give, given good responses and thank you participants now we'll start with our expert session thank you Thank you, Prashant. Before moving on to the national expert session, may I take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to our Dean, Dr. Dharmesh Silajya, sir. Dr. Dharmesh Silajya, sir, is an MBBS, MD and PhD from BJ Medical College, Gujarat University. He holds a vast experience of 23 years in the forensic domain. He joined as the Dean in the School of Medical Legal Studies in November 2020. We are looking forward to learn from his experience. So I want to take this opportunity and invite our Dean Sir, Dr. Dharmesh Silajya Sir, to kindly ad address the audience with his esteemed presence. Sir, I think your mic is unmute. I mean mute. Um, Ashika and uh, everyone, this is Dr. Rakhi Agrawal. Um, actually, I just got a message. Sir is uh, busy on some important call. So once he will be free, we will proceed with him. And otherwise, uh, we can start the session with our next speaker. Please proceed, at Ashika. Sure, ma'am. Sure. With this, may I now take this opportunity to proceed with the event and call the reputed national experts from National Forensic Sciences University. Audience, we'll be looking forward to your comments, views on the presentations of our experts and also your experience and questions as promised. The best comments in the comment section will be getting a big surprise filled with memories to take away. The mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates and the great teacher inspires. With this thought in mind, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to the next renowned personality that we have amongst us, Dr. G. Rajesh Babu, sir, who is a well-experienced academician and researcher with more than 24 years of research and teaching experience with strong academic qualifications. He is currently the Associate Dean of School of Medical Legal Studies at National Forensic Sciences University, India. He has expertise in anthropology, advanced fingerprint sciences, terminal ballistics, and material sciences. He has been training the officers of Bangladesh, Nepal Police, and forest officers of SARC countries and officers of other countries deputed under the ITEC scheme on various techniques in criminal investigations and also in the areas of ballistics, fingerprints, and crime scene analysis. He has published many research papers, book chapters, and various articles in popular magazines and media. He has guided six PhD students and many MSc dissertations. He is also a life member of Karnataka Medico, member of Legal Society, South Indian Medico Legal Association, 
Indian Association of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, Indian Association of Social Sciences and Health, and Indian Academy of Forensic Medicine. I respectfully invite you, sir, for delivering a talk on non-destructive methods and non-invasive procedures in contemporary scientific investigations of crimes. The platform is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nindu. In fact, it's a pleasure for me to uh, give a presentation in this platform. Because mainly, I have to mention one thing. Uh, I feel, first of all, proud that our students are able to uh, organize such an international uh, conference. And especially uh, for me, it is a proudful moment. Uh, first time that uh, we, our students are organizing such an event in the international platform, that too in an online platform. As our the vice chancellor has, uh, sir has mentioned, it is really too difficult. That is not an easy thing that to organize in uh, such a short period of time. Uh, definitely it is an adorable task. Of course, uh, congratulations to all the students the entire team who has organized uh, this particular event. Uh, without uh, wasting much of our time, uh, let me proceed with the topic. I will share my screen with you. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it now a full screen now? Okay. Yes, sir. Because yes, I am sir. using two systems simultaneously, I don't think there will be an, any sort of echoing, right? Every, uh, voice is clear? Okay. Yes. Oh, fine. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to mention uh, the, uh, the smallest part of uh, forensic sciences, how exactly it has evolved. That is, uh, I think most of the students, whoever uh, uh, comes to join this university, they used to mention, whenever I'm asking, they used to mention why, what motivated them uh, to take up this particular area, uh, the speciality for their academic uh, or their career. So there they used to mention about the um, uh, influence of different channels, influence of different uh, um, what to say, episodes uh, that comes in uh, different, different uh, TV channels. And apart from that, some uh, reporting in the newspapers, all of them have motivated them to, the, um, to a greater extent to take up this particular profession. Of course, uh, for the purpose of, uh, uh, there is a yeah, entertainment apart. There is another concept that uh, whatever we see, in those particular uh, episodes is not the one exactly that is uh, undertaken by us. Uh, moreover, it is not that easy also, whatever is being said in that. Of course, there are certain aspects which will be, uh, I can say that uh, uh, it, it, for the purpose of entertainment, there is a uh, uh, easy method of approaches. But uh, I should say as a forensic scientist, I'll be able to mention that things are not that easy as we uh, look at it. Uh, it is a combination of uh, uh, skill, a combination of uh, more and more analytical skill, rather I should say, and uh, more and more intelligence that is required in any particular uh, crime scene, back, uh, a particular thing, whichever we are going to analyze or resolve. So for that reason, it actually originated as, as you all must be knowing that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the father of forensic sciences, I should mention him as because, because of him, uh, the particular Sherlock Holmes, that is a popular uh, fiction that is even now people are uh, very much crazy to read. Uh, because whatever the uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, was doing, I mean, uh, the portrayal of Sherlock Holmes and Uh, that is the originating point, I should say. Apart from that, later on, slow and really, when we, it is, uh, 
which is related to criminal investigations to aid in the justice administration. This is the contemporary, uh, I mean, uh, conservative and conventional way of uh, finding forensic sciences. But there are, uh, like any other subjects, there is a gradual evolution. The evolution has got to a greater extent that it has reached to such an extent that it has become an omnipresent science every day. So contemporary forensic sciences, I should say, it is omnipresent. In the simplest sense, forensic science is existing in each and every field. Uh, uh, for that matter, whatever is going abnormal, whatever is looked abnormal, whatever things are happening, which are uh, abnormal, or I should say deviation from the uh, routine, there needs some sort of forensic approaches, what we call it as a forensic science investigation. So in a simplest sense, I'd be making it as a fact-finding science or error tracking. And in for that matter, three Ws we use always in everywhere. The analysis should be what went wrong. This is what is all about. So everywhere, I am uh, uh, hope you people are able to see some picture uh, on your screen. This looks very pretty, beautiful, very much uniform, regular. But what is there to mention that it is definitely uh, something uniform, but it is quiet, unnatural. Why so? Because perfection will not be there. If at all there is a perfection or regularity in everything, there needs to be some sort of prompting that will be there. So any abnormalcy, non-uniformity, or something which is abnormal, we will be able to look at simultaneously. Having said that, when we look something perfect in execution, makes everyone very much peculiar, confused, or it makes us think twice about. That is what is the speciality of forensic sciences. Something which is abnormally uniform, naturally we need to think about. There is something else. We should not think whatever we are looking at is not the one to be presumed at all. So there is a different presumption. There should be a different presumption whenever there is a perfection in something or execution. So this prompts us, obviously, a sort of an introspection, a stimulation, a sort of an incitement. So uh, as I mentioned about uh, uh, the ubiquitous nature, that is omnipresent nature that I was mentioning about, make or just coin a particular uh, uh, field, a particular entity, there we are uh, having the presence of forensic sciences. Let it be medicine, dentistry. I am talking from the conventional point of view. Medicine, dentistry, veterinary, pharmacy, engineering. Of late, the developed uh, or uh, evolved uh, uh, electronic uh, electronics and communication uh, systems. We have digital and information technology and so on. There is hardly, I can say, there is hardly any field you can mention which is insulated by forensic sciences. For that matter, I can uh, I used to uh, ask my students. Uh, so when they try to uh, tell about astronomy or agriculture, even there we are finding the importance of forensic sciences. So where exactly it is being useful, or when it is, yeah, everything as I mentioned already. When there is a failure, when there is an abnormalcy, some uneventuality, naturally there is a resolution possible with forensic sciences. Let it be a movable property of a, a vehicle or immovable property of a, a big structure. There, there is a requirement of forensic sciences. Let it be a twin tower desecration or a flight crash of Kalpana Chab, I mean, uh, uh, that uh, astronaut, uh, Kalpana Chabda, in which she was the particular vehicle uh, which she traveled to, to the space crash, there also there is a requirement of scientific approaches. That is what we are calling it as a forensic astronomy. So likewise, we can go on telling about, but to make it more and more simple for the purpose of using this particular topic I have mentioned, 
non-restrictive and non-invasive procedures, mainly because of the reason that there is uh, quite unusually, we are not having any particular uh, evidences that is the core point of forensic sciences is not that handy. This is not that much quantity that it is significant enough to give an analysis, but it is abnormally and abysmally low. I can mention it is uh, mainly because of the gradual evolution in the modus operandi also. Modus operandi has changed a lot. You can uh, see uh, those days uh, 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 conventionally when we uh, uh, think about forensic sciences, they will be always think, uh, mentioned about the uh, uh, murder or uh, robbery or a theft, which is, I can say, theft, uh, probably a robbery, they will be showing a knife or stabbing uh, somebody. That is what is the conventional method or perception of the crimes and the forensic sciences. That is not so nowadays. The, uh, the system has changed a lot. Without the presence of the individual, there is hardly any virtual crime scene, I should call it as. There is no crime scene as such, no criminal uh, presence in the particular crime scene also. Still, there is a commission of crimes. This is what I mean to say is sophistication. So sophistication may be he may be using some higher technologies, let it be information technology, exploration, whatever you call it as. They are the influence of those techniques. So ultimately, it is being used for the purpose of execution of the crime. So that is what is the gradual evolution I am mentioning about. So there is a sophistication, extraordinary skill that is being used by the perpetrator. And like those days, I mean, even 40, 50 days, uh, 50, sorry, 50 years ago also, there used to be a mention in the films, uh, a particular perpetrator, either he is a killer or a robber, he used to wear the gloves that, uh, uh, that he is uh, uh, to show that he is so skilled enough, knowledgeable, that he doesn't want to uh, leave his fingerprints over the crime scene. But having said that, as the uh, evolution occurs, the technology that is being used by the criminal is uh, increasing in the sense technological advancement increasing in the particular criminal. Naturally, as a forensic scientist, as an investigator, we should be always at least a one step ahead of them. We are always multiple steps ahead of them, at least a minimum one step we should be ahead of them. So for that reason, we need to equip ourselves with more and more technology which are contemporarily being investigated, I mean, used or introduced. So naturally, we need to have a, a, a sort of a, a, a evolution. We have to evolve ourselves for the purpose of coping up with or matching with the, at least we have to overcome all those particular techniques which are being used by the perpetrator. So naturally, we need to understand one thing, there is a high tech in application in the particular uh, perpetrator when he is executing the crime. Of course, the, the particular perpetrator, even though uh, he is using whatever be the skill, technique, or advanced uh, uh, intelligence, everything, but still at the time of commission of the crime, he is a criminal. So naturally, no crime can be, as we have a, a specific norm, no crime can be committed without leaving evidences. So, it is the duty of the particular forensic scientist to look for the evidences, whatsoever be the quantity or the a particular amount that is available in the particular crime scene. That is what uh, maybe in the form of a, a milli, micro, nano, pico, whatsoever it is. So it needs to be understood, even though the quantum is available, the quantum availability of the particular evidences are so small. Even we are able Sir, to, take me. There, is a, there is a possibility of using those particular uh, samples in a judicious manner so that we will be able to have a right results or the resolution of the particular claims. Okay, so uh, preferably I have to uh, choose a particular methodology, which is a physical or morphological examinations. Because here, uh, as I have mentioned about the smallest quantity or minimum quantity that is available from the crime scene because of the technocrats, technocrat uh, criminals. So naturally, I, am, I have to think about the maximum utilization 
without a compromise of the utilization with the exhaustion. It should not be exhausted also because a single opinion, uh, sing, for giving a single a rightful, reliable opinion to be arrived, we need to have multiple number of examinations, analysis to be conducted. So it needs to be understood a simple sense, in a simplest sense, a morphological or physical or surface analysis itself will take us to a right direction. Not once, multiple times, because after all, we are not going to destroy or district a particular evidence which is available with a very, very minimal quantity. So in this connection, I have to mention about the morphological study, which we have to uh, uh, describe about in any eventuality. So naturally, if at all we are uh, describing the morphology or the external examination or the external description, that itself will take us to a right direction, not only the right direction, of course, uh, if at all, I have to mention, we are not going to the extent of mentioning about 99% achievement of the uh, particular uh, uh, resolving mm. the More than 50% of the uh, results are achieved with the external or morphological examinations, for which we need to have a very sharp, obser very sharp observation, key noting of all those abnormalities or uniqueness, whichever we are finding out over the particular evidence. That is what is most and most vital. So every evidence needs to be analyzed morphologically, physically, and physicometrically and microscopically. Uh, this, uh, this is, uh, I can say, applied everywhere. That is, irrespective of the particular state of the uh, particular evidence, always we can think about using this particular examination, that is, physical, microscopic, or uh, metric systems, morphological system, we will be able to analyze irrespective of the state of matter. That particular matter may be a liquid or the solid. Only thing is we need to consider about the parameters accordingly. Think about this. These are all the ones which are liquid only. What comes to your mind, it is actually a, 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 in a forensic perspective, a particular petrochemical. Fine. Here we are having some sort of edible oil. So naturally, what is going to be done, we immediately we will be thinking about only the a particular manner in which a chemical characterization can be done through which we are able to Nicolo, get the absolute identity of the particular material. What is that? It is about the adulteration point of view that we are thinking about. Naturally, it doesn't require, I mean, before going into the characterization, that is chemical method of analysis, it is mandatory to use the physical components. So physical components as such will be sticking to the norms if at all a particular material is being a standard one. So naturally, when we are uh, taking about any particular substance, which I have shown you here, here not the one uh, exactly what I have mentioned, plenty of others, whatever is being consumed by the population, by the society, whatever is being used by the society, naturally it comes under the norms of the standards. So naturally they are, they are supposed to stick to the standards of the physical parameters, that is, let it be, we call it as in a physical parameter, density, specific gravity, viscosity, or the respect to this. Here, even the fourth decimal, the fourth decimal point deviation in the above parameters should sense as some sort of peculiarity, some sort of abnormality within the particular matter. So the refractive index we are having to the extent of uh, to the extent of sensitivity of the fourth decimal point, that also gives us some sort of intriguing factor. Okay, this is about the chemical. Now going to the biological matter. Likewise, I can go on telling about any number of uh, such materials. Let it be uh, 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 explosive residues, let it be fire residues, anything for that matter. Each and everything, whenever we are coming across, it gives us. For that matter, even the uh, paint analysis in the road traffic accidents or the glass analysis in the uh, road traffic accidents, everywhere we need to have such sort of mechanism that is sticking to the physical parameters which will interview us with a, some sort of peculiarity or abnormality in it that takes us in a right direction. So deviation 
with the minutest deviation i am talking about in the fourth decimal point that will also give us a right one what is this i am talking about now i am moving to the biological matter so here biological matter when i am uh, uh, mentioning about that can be anything uh, as i have already uh, mentioned about the non invasive procedures so i am not going to deal with the uh, the standards that is what uh, we are calling it as, as a gold standards without that i am going to mention about the other body fluids hope you people can understand about the body fluids which i am talking about than the blood that is the saliva sweat and other body fluids whatever we are coming across without any uh, particular invasive procedures we are following this will definitely narrow down our searches that is the same point which i have mentioned previously will come into picture that is let it be the specific gravity density or refractive index or for that matter even viscosity also can be of a good uh, parameters which we will be able to follow through which we will be getting some sort of unique ideas that will be taking us to the right direction of inve uh, investigation when we are having a chemical analysis directly we need to have plenty of analysis in a broader way that has to be done but when it comes to the uh, preliminary examinations that is the physical properties examinations when we are doing definitely it goes and it takes us in a right not only the right direction we will be able to have a narrow down searches instead of going for the broader view that will have a better uh, uh, judicious uh, manner of uh, using the time the time consumption becomes lesser and also the space so when i am mentioning about the time and space it will actually give more and more importance when we are actually landing up in a particular profession in which we are definitely going to be giving a particular opinion in a short period of time so it has to be judiciously utilized the, that is the reason why i am stressing upon the importance of physical properties of any such matter irrespective of the state it is so when we are closing on in that particular matter it gives a a, a, a probable identity then goes for the absolute nature so here when i uh, mention about these biological uh, fluids it takes us to the right direction of identification that is uh, i can mention about the gender ages habits lifestyle occupation exposure and diseases these are the ones which will be giving us some sort of clues when we are following up these physical properties of whatever has been mentioned earlier that is just based on a particular deviation in the particular parameter gives us a clue about a gender even for that matter a age habits lifestyle occupation exposure and even to certain extent this is also okay in that case i had to include one more thing that is race part which will be uh, mentioning you later okay now when we are talking about the uh, uh, non destructive procedures and uh, uh, non invasive methods i have already mentioned about the non invasive uh, parameters which we are using now the non destructive procedures when we are coming across obviously on hand available ones are the microscopy of course we have got a sophistication when it comes to the ultra modern techniques we are on hand available of course even uh, i think uh, our uh, um, uh, ability to the do we do it in dai jari do the dai stereo microscopy and also we are going to mention about the uh, morphological not only the morphological examination morphometric examination also can be done for that matter sky is the limit so in this case i am including every such methodology that we will be able to follow not only the scanning electron or even the atomic force microscopies also so that part of the examining that uh, type of the examination definitely take us to a greater extent that we will be able to characterize them both surface analysis we are doing and also we are going to the extent of mineral analysis so in that case we will be able to Uh, have a better approach whatever has been uh, mentioned previously 
that is habits, lifestyle, occupation, or the exposure and the disease, which will be uh, taken in a right manner, wherein we are going to identify exactly about the particular uh, 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 methodology and also the identification protocols that has to be followed based on the macro and micro minerals. Let it be uh, essential minerals, what we are talking about, which we will be able to go to a extent of standard deviations. When it deviates from the standards, naturally it will be prompting us to go to the extent of mentioning about their occupation, exposure, disease, or the lifestyle and the habits. So this, is, this can be done with the uh, whatever the microscopic examination, which I was talking about, then X-ray fluorescence techniques also available. And apart from that, these biological, the particular exoskeleton, which we are talking about, like uh, bones, teeth, or hair, we will be able to understand not only with the morphometry, even goniometric examinations can also give us one more uh, available uh, physical uh, uh, traits what I can call it as is a uh, uh, primary identification parameter that is gender, age, race also can be available. That is huh? even what that is the what is the also huh? uh, one of the yeah. other parameters with which we will be able to go ahead with. So that means to say morphological and morphometric examination can be an added value. In addition to that, wherever there is a possibility of mentioning about the angulation, goniometry is also a classical one. For that matter, we have done an extensive research based on all this, uh, whatever the biological tissues, which are non-invasive procedures in which with which we have followed, we have found out a classical, uh, we have uh, got the um, reliable results as far as geographical and occupational markers are concerned. We could go to the extent of identifying them based on these micro or macro minerals for the purpose of getting them into the occupational, as an occupational marker or a geographical marker. Okay, coming back to the uh, core areas, that is uh, core areas of fingerprint, uh, forensic sciences like fingerprints in which uh, this is the only one particular entity I can mention, biometrics I can mention, where there is no such evolution, drastic evolution has done, has been done. For that matter, I have to mention, even after 140 years, to be more precise, that is 1882, it started with, even now, 2021, we are nearing 140th year. In spite of that, we are able to follow the same method which was followed those things. So in that way, it, it has to be mentioned a robust one, a robust entity, and most importantly, a non-invasion and the simplest procedure and the most reliable one before death, after death, uh, sorry, before birth, after death, that it is possible. But as far as the techniques are concerned, we are coming out with a uh, evolution that is evolved to such an extent we are not going to have any sort of restriction in the during the process of uh, development, like chemical methods or the even the powdering techniques. Also, we had some sort of uh, once you when only once it is to be used. Now we are having the contactless methods in which we will be able to get to know the details of whatever has been mentioned earlier. Like as I repeating once again, as I am repeating once again, like a gender age, race, occupation, habits, lifestyle, and exposure can also be established based on these techniques. Simultaneously, I, I have to mention, it is not that I am uh, sticking to the particular entity of non-invasion and non-restriction, mainly because of the reason that we are using microscopy, morphometry, and also the sophisticated techniques of both the entities based on the AFM and scanning electron microscope respectively. So in that case, morphometry is also possible. Microscopy is also extensively being used. Next one, I have to mention about other uh, core area of forensic sciences, like document examination. Even here, we are uh, sticking to the method of non-invasion and non-destruction based on the procedures such as ESDA and BSC, which are all uh, uh, sophistication 
of late we are having all sorts of electromagnetic variations which are classically uh, uh, being used in a judicious manner for the purpose of establishing the authenticity and also any sort of forgery that has been uh, mentioned, I mean, that has been found to be established. In such a case, I'll be able to mention not only these uh, forgeries or any other document examination, for that matter, even in security, any sort of security uh, 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 documents that also can be of major use. Next one, I have to move ahead with the another core area that is ballistics. Ballistics is, as all we know, that it is a study of the firearms in which we are going to identify, our duty is to identify the particular range perpetrator, identifying the perpetrator also, and the direction and the distance at which it has been fired from. So origin also we have to establish and also the identification of the perpetrator. These are the ones which we are able, capable of doing that just based on the same procedure which I have mentioned previously, that is with the same method of morphometric examination, scanning electron microscopy, and also apart from that, we are going to use other sophisticated techniques which, will, which we will be able to get to know the exact detail about the particular identity of the perpetrator and also the ranges. The, uh, as I have been mentioning about not to have any sort of uh, chemical intervention or destructive procedures we are going to follow as far as the residual analysis is concerned. Here, we are still sticking to only the morphological and morphometric examination of the residue particles based on which we are capable of establishing the ranges. Next uh, one, which is the off-plate, another uh, non-invasive procedure which we are uh, following on the uh, uh, specific uh, manner of investigation on the suspect is the uh, eye detection. Because uh, our Vice Chancellor sir has mentioned about the psychological examination based on the physiological parameters, deviation in the physiological parameters for the purpose of detection of deception. Now, the same way, even uh, not even subjecting them to any such sort of physiological parameters to be established, here we are going to establish the deviation just based on the eye tracking me mechanism. So in this way, we will be able to detect to a greater extent about the detection of deception. So this is one of the most recent development that I can uh, uh, we can rely on for the purpose of detecting the deception. For that matter, when we continue, I can mention about the voice examination, layered of voice analysis in one among them, wherein I'll be able to make the particular individual not necessarily to be physically present, even on the offline mode also, the online and offline mode also is possible, wherein I, we will be able to get the standards uh, formed and the base, uh, uh, the base is created. With the base, we are going to uh, compare the particular voice which we are uh, collecting from the particular suspect, wherein we will be able to get to know about the details of the deception. To this extent, I will be able to mention for that matter, as you all know, of recent, we are uh, um, uh, moving ahead with the database of the voice also, in which voice spectrometry is a classical one, which is off late, it is the, uh, what I can say, uh, reliable biometry in the opting. And having said that all, of course, time is very, very uh, limited. So I am restricting myself to a very uh, short uh, presentation. and. Uh, I am emphasizing one more thing as uh, that I have previously uh, mentioned also, no crime can be committed without leaving evidences. That means to say absence of evidence is not an evidence of absence. We, it is the duty of the investigator to look for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for, your, for sharing your valuable insights with us. Your session was full of enthusiasm and knowledge. So as we have mentioned earlier to the audience that the best questions uh, will be getting a big surprise. So let's see what all questions we have you for, sir. Uh, so sir, our first question is from Raghav that uh, he's saying that you mentioned about the fire residue analysis. 
So can we apply this methodology for normal case scenarios to understand historic disasters? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I have to mention one thing that uh, uh, basically a particular residue, usually uh, for the purpose of confirmation, we used to do the chemical analysis. As I always, uh, uh, for that matter, I am not going to demean, I am not going to have a comparison, which is superior, which is inferior, not at all. Everything is equal. For that matter, I always used to mention chemistry is the fulcrum. Chemicals are the fulcrum. So having said that, even that chemical is subjected for the physical analysis. That is what my point is. So the physical analysis of a chemical will give a right picture. So when I'm mentioning about the particular uh, uh, fire, uh, fire rescue, for that matter, a particular fire scene, we used to do with a microscopic examination, wherein we have the standards, already I have mentioned, ISI standards is available. Standards are available for the physical parameters. Let it be uh, weight or let it be uh, density or let it be uh, weight whatsoever it is. Here we are having the uh, specific standard parameters are in place. Those standard parameters are to be analyzed, whichever the uh, uh, residue that we are coming across. That is, if at all we are getting the particular uh, burnt material, still we are going ahead with the microscopic examination wherein we are finding out the deviations. For that matter, I will give a clue also, yeah, um, uh, one more clue also, not necessary to subject to a higher temperature, a minute, I mean, uh, slightly above the uh, ambient temperature I am talking about. I will talk about the uh, ambient temperature is about uh, 35 degrees. Even at the temperature of 40 degree, when it is subjected to a particular material, it gives some sort of deviation. That means, I mean to say, morphologically, there are changes which you are not going to witness in the unaided examination. Visual examination will not have any sort of uh, differences will be found. Whereas, when we are going ahead with the morphometric examination, microscopic analysis, definitely we are going to find out the particular uh, material which is subjected for a higher temperature. So, that gives a rough idea that it has been subjected for the higher temperature. The same thing we have proved even in the electrocution also. Even in the electricity, when there is an electrocution, a minor temperature which will be available, that is uh, due to that sparking, may have some sort of influences in the morphometry of the uh, particular uh, material, metallic wire, which always gives a slightly higher parameters than that of the normal, which shows that there was a heat that was applied to it, whatever be the uh, um, source it can be. In this case, we are proving that it is a case of an electrocution, electric short circuiting, for the, I, sh I should have been more precise, electric short circuiting, that has resulted in the uh, particular morphological changes rather I mean to say morphometric changes that has been uh, found that gives an idea about the, uh, the particular, uh, that gives a clue about the influence of the temperature. So I, I want to emphasize even the minimum temperature that is being subjected is giving that much of a differences. So naturally, higher temperature will lead, lead to greater uh, deviations in the morphology and morphometry. This is uniform, this is universal to any matter. Even for that matter, we have analyzed the, um, even uh, fire uh, cases in the uh, dental tissues also, dental heart tissues also we have subjected to, wherein we could find the changes. Of course, we have found out some formula uh, to assess the temperature of the particular uh, subject in the sense, uh, given the heart tissue, what was the particular temperature it was subjected to? that we had derived a formula based on our um, analysis through the morphometric examinations. So that can be done. Hope the, the answer is uh, convincing. Yes. I think uh, people, oh. Yes, sir. I think it must have addressed the doubts. Uh, the second question is from Nikunj, that can you please enumerate the factors defining the ingenuity of the matter? Okay. 
ingenuity of the matter whatever uh, now right now i was mentioning about what is uh, ingenuity of matter you just uh, take one uh, mm, a simplest example which i was uh, telling you right now that is in the uh, road side we are uh, coming across a uh, number of uh, uh, roads for that matter i have to give you one more example uh, alexander mm, i think uh, not even alexander i should say um mm, yeah great napoleon in his court he asked for uh, his minister to find out there was one case that uh, to find out the genuineness of a, a particular uh, flower and the fruit fine there was a fruit that was brought to the court of that uh, particular uh, emperor so he was clueless or to because uh, it doesn't have any uh, peculiarity or abnormality so one key thing uh, the particular minister did was he had opened the doors and windows all around and he had seen that there were the uh, particular cannabis which have been attracted towards then he proved the case now this is a classical example when i was mentioning about the uniformity for that matter i i can give an example of a handwriting or a signature when i am asking when you are asked to put the signature three times it won't be the same but when it is a uh, uh, it is the same that means that there was a forgery that means there was a forgery so what we come across the natural variation should be there natural variation is a uh, undetectable it is has to be there so naturally when we are coming across some sort of uniformity we need to think about something else it is not that uh, universal but still when there is a non uniformity we are thinking about that but successively uh, uniformity also should introduce as some sort of abnormal seen wait okay fine is that clear yeah i think sir it will Uh, it will be clear to our audience the next question is from ramika uh, can you please shed some light on the basic differences between morphometry and goniometry uh, actually um, i should say uh, um, a simplest example i can quote uh, is that uh, because a uh, dental tissue heart tissues that is yeah, when we have studied about the dental heart tissue uh, Mm, you can uh, find uh, uh, classical canines canines when we are examining uh, it is not i have already mentioned about the uh, non destructive procedures wherein i was mentioning only about the morphology and morphometry and one more entity i was mentioning about was the goniometry so goniometry is the one which gives some sort of it, that is a particular angle of inclination Uh, generally in our uh, uh, normal uh, mm, uh, human uh, tendency is that we are going for some sort of deviation in the angles every day for that matter especially in the commission of the crimes we always look for some sort of deviations as far as investigation is concerned so if the deviation is not only pertaining to the size or the dimensions it has to be with the angle also so when there is a variation in the angle that has to be uh, 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 that has to be referred to that means it gives a greater picture that there is something abnormal so goniometry is relating to the finding out the angular variation in a particular subject or a particular entity which we are working on the reason only i have mentioned about the dentition wherein we will be we were able to find out the differences in the angle of the particular heart tissue among the lions those are found in uh, uh, madhya pradesh or in gujarat in uh, asiatic lions we have found the differences of the angle uh, with that of other Uh, lines which are found everywhere else so this was the one of the other parameter which we have found out as a geographical marker that they belong to a particular area particular uh, 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 geographical area hope you can understand about that goniometry relates to the finding out of angle in any particular subject wherever there is a feasible is that clear 
थैंक यू सो मच सर सर सो लाइक नाउ विल बी मूविंग ऑन टू वर्ड्स एंड नेक्स्ट स्पीकर but before that i would like to tell our audience that please keep on commenting please uh, keep sharing us your feedbacks questions okay and as we have said as we have mentioned earlier that the best questions will be given uh, big surprises so with this we will move on uh, towards our next speaker a good mentor holds our hands opens our minds and touches the heart just like a cell is incomplete without a nucleus the audience is incomplete without the speaker The next intriguing lecture will be delivered by Dr. Bhagav Patel sir, who is a well-qualified and technic uh, and technically proficient academician with more than ten years of research and teaching experience. His expertise include molecular diagnostics and microbiology, lab and field research work, data collection, analysis and project management. Currently, he is an assistant professor of senior scale in the forensic biotechnology at National Forensic Sciences University, India. His research areas include forensic genetics and forensic microbiology. He has been deputed as a resource person as a resource person at several national and international laboratories. He has eleven research papers published, along with two book chapters followed by a patent. He has guided four PhD students and sixty-eight MSc dissertations. He is also the member of Biotech Research Society of India. Indian Science Congress and Indian Society for Human Genetics he is currently working on two active research projects so without wasting any further time i would now invite dr bhagat patel sir to give us uh, to give us insights on the topic a novel approach for processing of bd as a touch dna evidence over to you sir oh thank you thank you so much nandini even i was also not knowing about me so much <laughs> anyway uh, i'm sharing my screen uh, let me let me share the screen first is my screen up visible yes, yes sir you are visible uh okay now is it in a full screen mode yes sir yeah so uh, once again thank you very much for the whole team right so that uh, organizing such a wonderful and one of its kind conference uh organized by the students right so it was amazing to be a part of this particular event and uh, feeling thrilled right because uh, so much thing has been told by nandini that okay blah 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 right so uh, i'm also conscious now that okay you are expecting too much from me so anyway i'll try my level best to uh, deliver uh, something which we have learned so far uh, with our research experience in our lab so yeah uh, when when uh, she told me that okay you have to represent means you have to present some uh, you know talk on this uh, platform then i was also thinking that okay what should i do then nandini herself suggested that yes yeah, sir you can you can present your this paper so immediately i told yes okay no problem i'll i'll present this particular work uh, actually uh, this particular work is already uh, published work in uh, forensic science international recently two months back uh, and uh, uh, i wanted to you know touch up this topic uh, uh, the one of the reason was also that that uh, nowadays people are you know talking about touch dna and all that so what exactly the touch dna is and uh, uh, you know because of this particular research we learned certain lessons so that also i wanted to share with all of you and anyway just i wanted to you know uh, interact with all of you that was the ultimate Uh, aim and uh, let us have fun. Uh, first of all, uh, the contents. Okay, what I am going to you know uh, speak, then hold hold this you know speech. So introduction, methodology, results, and conclusion. So this is just a research paper. So this will be the flow, right? So let us go through the introduction. So what exactly this uh, topic is, and why I am emphasizing on this particular topic too much. So the BD. we all know that uh, this is one of the favorite uh, material for uh, many indians not only indians but now it is getting uh, popularity all over world as a you know alternative to cigarettes because of its economy because of its uh, different flavors and uh, uh, you know because of sometimes you know the strongness and a lot of you know reasons for that but ultimately it is cheaper uh, source than the cigarette 
and uh, it is available in uh, some um, flavors also and uh, that's why it is uh, uh, the choice of a common man in india and now uh, because of this uh, you know bd uh, got there are lots of uh, reports that how smoking smoking kills we know that right but uh, smoking can you uh, you know can lead to you in jail also so that uh, is also because of you know the current uh, technologies which are available uh, for analysis in forensic science so first of all let us have an introduction to the, the bd exactly you know many indian uh, all the indians are knowing about this but few people who are uh, you know from uh, overseas may not be knowing about this basically it is a hand rolled cigarette you can see the here right so this is how it is available right in the market and it is available in a package of 25 in the market and different brands are available in india right and nowadays you can see the tobacco less arugyam you know the herbal bds are also available and you can enjoy that without harming your health but uh, this is also you know uh, available on uh, you know in market and even even online platforms are also it is available and it is because nicotine free that's why it is available and the most important you can uh, see here the the lady is preparing the bd here you can see uh, this is a completely handmade process and with the leaves of tendu that is actually uh, a, a plant which is available in uh, india uh, in many places in many states it is available but mainly in madhya pradesh and uh, uh, the uh, around surround area of the madhya pradesh is having a very uh, you know dense uh, population of this kind of leaves and it is available for this and tobacco is uh, basically filled in this hand rolled cigarette and it is uh, tied by a uh, small thread and then it is available in the market so this was about the bd now why bd is an evidence so this is i have just given one uh, you know uh, report from times of india published on 29th december in 2019 uh, this particular report is from uh, uh, Gandhinagar FSL lab. Basically, they caught one person based on the uh, spit and uh, based on this uh, BD. So at that time, you know, uh, uh, actually, uh, this particular BD, uh, you know, the saliva which is available on the BD is a source of DNA, basically. And uh, uh, of course, it is utilized by forensic experts also. But the problem is, Whenever you are encountering such kind of evidences, so to get the DNA out of this particular stuff is somewhat challenging. The reason is because it is having, uh, you know, uh, you can say tobacco inside that. Apart from that, whenever the pe uh, persons are smoking the BD at that time, uh, you know, the tar material, which is also coming into the uh, filter, actually uh, this particularly BD is filterless. So the tar material is coming into, uh, in the filter of cigarette, but here the tar material is directly uh, collected at the at the end of the BD. Uh, that is also one thing, uh, one reason. And uh, another thing is temperature. So temperature is also affecting, uh, you know, the quality of DNA on that. So because of this, whenever this BD is processed, uh, basically uh, it is considered to be a not good evidence, right? Because cigarette butt is already popular. And uh, uh, recently, you know, people have uh, recognized the importance of this particular BD stuff as an evidence, okay? So as an evidence, it is really, uh, you know, uh, 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 wonderful evidence because see, many a time when, when the uh, uh, crime has happened in, uh, you can say, jungles or many, uh, some areas where, or you can say a, a properly uh, organized crime is there, the definitely people are having such kind of, you know, habits. And that's why they will, uh, you know, leave such kind of evidences on the crime scene. And it can be utilized for analysis. Now, let us have an anatomy of BD, right? What exactly how you can see this is uh, approximately six to seven centimeter long, uh, you know, BD, which is uh, if you break it, it is having tobacco inside that. And whenever you are finding on the crime scene, you will find this particular BD stub, which is having, you know, the end part of the BD. And you can say the burned part of the BD mostly you are having, right? So this is how you are going to get on the crime scene. So how this particular is uh, very important as a uh, you know uh, dna evidence so let us uh, you know explore that particular part so exactly what is the source of dna on bd so the epithelial cells right basically they are derived from the lips and the fingers of the smoker who is smoking that bd right and those cells are basically get entrapped onto the surface of the bd that uh, you know stub part 
and saliva which is coming continuously into the you know that end part because of the capillary action also and continuously you are uh, you know puffing that particular bd and at that time you know you are depositing your salival cells and apart from that you know epithelial cells from your both the leaves uh, uh, you know leaves upper leaves and uh, lower leaves both and this is the basically source of dna and not only you know a uh, few cells but hundreds and thousands of cells are available on the bd right i'll i'll show you the data what exactly we got is uh, you can see uh, now next what were the objectives when we planned this study so that first we wanted to you know optimize an innovative cell lution step to get epithelial cells free from bd components the main problem was to get the dna uh, without any kind of inhibitors without any kind of tobacco material and all that so how can we do that so we thought of that okay uh, why can't we uh, you know isolate the uh, cells first and then wash them properly and then uh, uh, extract the dna so that we thought that okay uh, it should work and then it worked basically then we wanted to optimize the cell evolution buffer so there are lots of you know uh, detergents which are available to get uh, you know those cells into your buffer so basically when the uh, cells are uh, you know attached on to the uh, tend to leaves which is there so if you want to get those cells you have to wash it with some detergents right but at the same time the concentration of detergent detergent is also need to be optimized because if you will take the higher concentration the cells will immediately get lysed that also we don't want so immediately you know the 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 optimum concentration should be there so that we can get the cells intact and then later on we can wash them and properly uh, we can uh, process for the dna extraction and then to get rid of pcr inhibitors which generally are coaxiated with the uh, you know uh, cigarette butt and bd butt so cigarette butt is always a challenging sample and that's why the bd butt is also similarly and to evaluate the dna yield and quality of str profile and mitochondrial dna analysis so what exactly we uh, how you know for example if we are getting the dna but exactly why we are getting this dna to get the str profiling or to do the mitochondrial dna analysis so we wanted to ultimately know how much quantity and how much quality of how quality of dna we are getting out of that so they wanted we wanted to check so what methodology was uh, you know applied so you can see here we tested uh, two uh, cell evolution buffer actually a small study was already carried out by one dissertation students uh, uh, lakshita was there right she was our uh, previous students uh, senior so sds and twin 20 gave very good results so that's why uh, she already optimized the concentration and everything so we we wanted to just test that with this bd stuff and then uh, direct lysis so we wanted to compare the uh, cell elution method as compared to you can say directly cell lysis uh, so directly bd lysis so basically what happens whenever you are getting the cigarette butt on the crime scene forensic analysts are doing what exactly they are doing they are cutting the uh, butts into two part one part they will take it for the dna extraction and then that directly they are adding into the lysis reagents right and then directly getting the dna but in that case what exactly is happening that co extraction of the material is, is uh, you know other materials which are pcr and which are tar and phenolic compounds and lot many other you know which are chemical compounds present in tobacco and tobacco smoke so they are also getting co extracted so they we wanted to you know get rid of that and that's why we uh, approached you know uh, with this particular you know uh, innovative uh, washing step we added then dna extraction methods we wanted to compare the dna extraction method as well that see popularly uh, people are using directly the kit bed method in the forensic scenario but even the phenol chloroform organic extraction the gold standard of dna extraction is still utilized so we wanted to compare with exactly we are getting the good dna quantity or quality or not so we compared this two techniques uh, of course dna quantification was done by uh, trio dna quantification kit which is uh, well known kit for dna quantification uh, based on real time pcr principle and then finally we amplified all the dna with str amplification kit uh, with global filer pc amplification which is having 24 markers inside that and we evaluated the profiles and everything so let us see what we got exactly uh, before that yes this was the innovative, innovative cell elution step we employed you can see here yeah the, uh, little bit i wanted to discuss with this you can see here whenever you are having a bd stub inside you know uh, whatever the uh, cell evolution buffer we are getting so after the incubation of 30 minute you are going to get your cells inside this particular solution but the stub which is there it may 
we hypothesized that it may contain cell still even after washing it also so what we did is we employed the piggyback method which was uh, you know this is nothing but uh, just uh, you can say the the um, column small column you are using and uh, through which uh, you are centrifuging it and whatever the uh, you know remaining material remaining uh, you know uh, this uh, elution buffer that you are getting uh, you know by centrifugation so whatever the elution buffer you are getting you are mixing it with here once again and you are getting all complete uh, elution buffer here but here you are getting you know cell uh, basically this uh, stub which is already processed now we we thought that we have extracted the cell but still we wanted to get uh, you know to check whether this particular stub is can, containing still few more cells or not basically because you know uh, on forensic uh, scenario to get the sample is also very difficult and to get sample in good quantity that is uh, you know another luxury that is never possible right so uh, we wanted to check each and every part then after this uh, you are centrifuging once again at 8000 rpm and you are getting a pellet basically this pellet is having a good amount of cells in which we are interested so this is the main source of dna but apart from that we hypothesized that it might be possible that cell free dna is available in supernatant and few cells still are attached with the bd stub so this one two and three this three part we took from each and every wash and then we uh, subjected to uh, heat based dna extraction and phenol chloroform based dna extraction so almost uh, uh, we did uh, molina uh, who is working under me as a phd student she performed all these experiments and she designed all the experiments and uh, optimized everything and finally uh, she did uh, this particular isolation of dna and quantification of dna so let's see what exactly you know happen so first of all cell elution efficiency if you will see that in this graph you can see here the both uh, tween 20 and sds gave the cells that is not an issue but you can see the sds is the champion here right so sds gave a very good re uh, results see how how you might be asking that how you calculated the number of cells so basically simply we used hemocytometer to you know locate the epithelial cells and uh, count the cells based on that particular whatever the material we have a 60 microliter solution we took from this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that washing solution and then we calculated the you know uh, cell density so you can see this for 60 microliter we are getting even one thing you will surprise to know that yes fresh bd samples which were not smoked which directly we purchased from the market also contained the cells so uh, from 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 uh, can you can you, can anybody tell me from where the cells are coming yeah from where cells this cells might be coming and yes because it is you know humans are involved in preparing of that process and definitely the skin cells or you can say the finger cells of those persons are also deposited on this now that is a problem that is a problem that is called a mixture profile you are going to get definitely so we got those also mixture profile definitely that we are going to i am going to discuss about that later on but right now just you uh, uh, remember that sds worked better and it was also not uh, killing the cells it means the whatever the concentration that was almost i think 0.05 molar i, I did not remember the exact concentration it is there in our paper so that uh, uh, was uh, uh, good okay then uh, we got you know the good cells you can see the almost 25000 cells more than 25000 cells we are getting in uh, 2020 but you can say more than 30000 cells we were getting per 60 microliter of the uh, sample and then after this getting the cells what exactly happened to the dna quantity and quality if you see so whenever you are using uh, you know when you are uh, quantifying dna using that uh, trio kit that uh, quantifier trio kit basically three things that particular kit is giving you first dna quantity second whether it is a male or female third uh, if it is a mixed uh, mixed male and females are mixed then how much ratio of male and female is this and fourth thing yes it is giving degradation index how much dna is degraded basically it is having you know the uh, the the big target and small target i am not going in much more detail in that chemistry because it is beyond our discussion but uh, based on the chemistry it is having uh, you know uh, it is it it can uh, tell you that okay how much uh, big chunk of dna is amplified and how much small chunk of dna amplified and based on that based on that ratio it can tell you that how much dna is degraded and how much not 
Okay, so based on this parameter, when we evaluated, then you can see the eluted cells. I told you that three parts we uh, we isolated DNA from uh, eluted cells, process BD stuffs, and supernatant. So you can see the what happened to eluted cells. So you can see the kit based method uh, worked, and organic method also worked. But here you can see the degradation index was very much high in organic extraction, what exactly phenol chloroform extraction method is. But you can see the kit made method, the kit, yeah, I told you that kit uh, for DNA extraction, we used uh, chiagens, uh, blood and tissue, uh, DNA, blood and tissue isolation, uh, uh, blood and tissue uh, DNA extraction kit we used. So you can see here that DNA was in a very good quantity, but you can see the quantity of the DNA is still, you can see it is 0, 0.0, 6, 0 0.07 or 0 0.075, almost that much quantity we got with the kit. But you can see the quantity of DNA by organic extraction method. You can see up to three nanogram DNA, we, uh, sorry, up to 2.2 .2 nanogram DNA in both twin and SDS, both we are get, getting that. But at the same time, you can see the degradation index. So that reflected even STI, in STI profile also that I'll, I'll show you later on. Uh, you can see the direct lysis of the BD stubs, so which are already processed for the cells. You can see here with the kit, how much DNA you are getting? 0.3 nanogram. You can see you are surprised to know that uh, if eluted cells are having is this much low amount of cell, then why this stub is having so much DNA? Right. Uh, okay. Even even we were we actually uh, this is the work we have to analyze the result properly. So when we uh, come back to definitely few plant cells or you can say even even uh, you know certain cells we might have got from those those leaves also and apart from that it is giving a better result still it means still the cells are there human basically uh, you may ask that okay why plant cells are uh, you know how how plant dna will not inter interact with this because whatever the, the trio kit we are utilizing it is targeting only human DNA. It is not targeting plant DNA. So plant DNA will not be quantified here. So only human DNA. But you can see human DNA is very high. Then how it, uh, it, it is it possible? So it means your BD stubs is containing still the human cells, which are not extracted by it. It means your extraction process is not exactly 100% efficient. But still, even we, we, we optimized that. But still, it means if you will, uh, so that was the optimum process we optimized. Because if you uh, incubate for for longer period of time, then what will happen? Your cells will get lysed. So that we don't we didn't want it. So that was the ultimate you know time that we optimized. So that was the reason. And another thing you can see here, the organic also you can say gave the but you can say the inter, uh, degradation index is also very high. It means that it is working properly as compared to the phenyl chloroform. You can see when the processed uh, you know stub is there. So the DNA quantity, you can see the degradation index is very high in organic, but you can say here, but here in, in organic extraction method, SDS organic, uh, you know, method gave good DNA and low degradation index, the degradation index is still very, is very high. You can say it is up to three, more than three. So that was very high. Uh, supernatant, right, with our surprise, uh, supernatant gave a very good quality and quantity of DNA. You can see the twin kit, gave a very clean DNA, you can see here, and a very good amount of DNA. So it means that DNA is having, cell-free DNA is present in the supernatant, so you should not discard the supernatant, you should use that supernatant for your uh, work. Apart from that, the obviously organic extraction method gave the result, but with the higher degradation index as expected. Now come to the STR profiling uh, quality. So, uh, you know, salute and direct lysis. If you compare this particular graph with each other, then you can see here full profile. In case of SDS kit, right, and twin kit, both we were getting, you know, almost 100% to 90% uh, profile from all the samples. I'll tell you that uh, we used 10, 10 samples for each and every category. So out of 10, all 10 samples gave the profile, full profile for SDS kit in terms of salute. So that was successful that, okay, if you are washing the cells, you are getting a good profile and perfect profile. Okay. Now you, you might ask that what happened to those, uh, you know, uh, previously deposited cells. It means the person who has not smoked the uh, particular BD and deposited the cells. Actually, they are called minor profiles. We got definitely the peaks of those profiles, but the peaks which we were getting of those particular person who smoked this particular BD, 
where very high in concentration and that's why it easily you can easily distinguish this particular profile and moreover you are having that profile with you you know the reference profile is with you and that's why you can compare it and you can you know uh, do the analysis accordingly and in forensic scenario definitely whenever you are comparing the dna str profile you are going to definitely uh, compare with some reference right it might be from suspect it might be from victim or it might be from any eyewitness or any other witness okay so this is required otherwise i, I either you are going to compare with the database and still in india we don't have database definitely you are going to uh, compare with some other exhibits or some other reference samples similarly in supernatant you can see uh, supernatant we got uh, profiles but you can see in all the cases most of the cases we got a partial profile right uh, you can see in twin kit sds kit in organic also we got some uh, full profile but 50% full profile 50% uh, partial profile so this is how the supernatant worked properly then process stub so after the you know getting dna from the process stub when we subjected to dna amplification so uh, you know you can see uh, the organic extraction failed completely you can see uh, 80 to 70% uh, we we could not get the profile and whatever the profile we got they were partial and hardly you know 10% profile or you can say 5% profile which were there which were giving the proper profile otherwise you can see the kit based methods were giving almost 90% in case of twin kit and 60% uh, in case of sds kit so you know process stub and supernatant both are giving the proper result as compared to l salute also salute is giving definitely good results but both the things are giving the perfect results so what exactly the conclusions are of the study right so you can say that an additional process of cell evolution from bd stubs prior to uh, dna extraction was systematically evaluated in the present study and successfully evaluated the sdscb sdscb means cell evolution buffer proved to be the better buffer for cell extraction with the concentration and whatever the time which we have optimized the three components cell elute supernatant and the process stub obtained after the cell elution process of the smoke bd stub showed varied amount of the dna obviously it was expected that it is going to be we, actually we were not expecting the dna in supernatant and uh, mostly in in in, in stub but uh, with our uh, you know uh, that opposite to our thinking that basically it gave the results fresh bd samples so that we expected definitely it will be uh, exhibiting the presence of dna but obviously there were the minor profiles and it could be handled properly but yes you have to be very careful while analyzing any unknown bd samples when you are not having any uh, you can say reference sample with you right because it is going to be uh, very messy stuff because uh, it is very difficult to analyze mixed profiles especially then dna obtained by the modified organic method from directly live stubs was highly degraded so we we already uh, uh, you know observed that the dna uh, degradation index was very high and the organic extraction method doesn't work properly and that's why you should prefer prefer the silica based bed technique that is biogen based technique uh, to our surprise the process stub yielded the highest amount of dna than both cell elute as well as supernatant by all extraction methods and proving it to be a potential source of dna for forensic application it means when you are having such samples and you should be very careful by, by you should not underestimate any any uh, you can say size of the sample or you can say the type of the sample and the cell elute component proved to be the best source of dna for sti profiling in terms of quality quantity and sti profile so ultimately cell elute is the best source of dna and best candidate for the forensic analysis but apart from that in our study we found that even the process stub and the supernatant is also giving equally uh, you can say important result and you should go for that if you want to go for that particular results what are the lessons we learned do not discard the bd stub after dna extraction <laughs> you should preserve it and <laughs> you, you can use it for later analysis as well right because it will preserve the dna for longer period of time even supernatant is good source of dna so don't waste it you should collect it and you should preserve it right for uh, whatever the period of time the case is running and the third thing the most important thing wash your stubs for better results we know that since one and a half years we are washing our ends similarly we have to wash even the crime scene samples properly it means we have to process crime scene samples properly and such kind of you know optimized methods should be approached 
and should be devised for each and every different kinds of samples so that maximum DNA recovery can be possible, right? And we know that every crime scene is a unique crime scene and every evidence is a unique evidence. But at least you should categorize them and you should you know, work for those uh, uh, things. Okay, these are the few references from that article, right? And uh, thank you for uh, being a curious audience. So I hope I have finished in that particular time frame which was given to me. Right, oh. Nandini? Uh, thank you so much, sir. Yes, Ashika. Yes, sir. What a valuable and amazing session it was. Thank you for sharing your great knowledge and research experience with us. As you can see, the audience actively participated in your session, sir. So we have some bucket of questions for you. Shall I okay. ask? No problem. Absolutely. Okay, sir. So the first question comes from Chandrasekhar. He says, what is the stats applied for the DNA reports and presenting before the court with statistics to DNA reports, sir? Which statistics is applied? Yes, sir. For DNA reports. Okay. So there are uh, two terminology for that. That is called likelihood ratio. That is LR ratio. And another is, uh, you can say, uh, probability. Right, how much uh, you know uh, that is called uh, dis discrimination power. Right, so this is how you can report it. Mostly, it is reported in likelihood ratio. That okay, uh, what is the chance that randomly this particular uh, you know uh, DNA profile is occurring on crime scene randomly? So that chance would be one in trillions, or you can say even even multi trillions. And that's why the court will believe that, okay, this is that, uh, you know, the world population is not more than 7 billion. So definitely the DNA profile, which is coming on the crime scene, if it is comparable with the suspect, then definitely it is the same. And that's why the court is believing that, okay, this is the match. And then the court is uh, giving the justice. So this is how the statistics is applied. Thank you, sir. I hope he got his answer. The second question comes from Vishali. She says, so why BD was considered for research? Did you keep the international standards in mind for research as BD is not available everywhere? Can we do disease analysis from this study using DNA? Yeah, Vishali, uh, it's a very good question. Even this question was, uh, you know, asked by reviewers also, right? And once our paper got rejected from one journal based on this particular question, right? But I'll tell you that uh, why it, were, it, it got accepted in another journal because, because the BD is, 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 is uh, utilized in India, many Asian countries, and it is making the, you can say, almost 40 to 50 percent part of the world. So uh, is, is, uh, it, it is not a small amount of the population. So even, you know, uh, uh, we, we wanted to do, because the BD is uh, regularly encountered on crime scene in India. So we wanted to study that at all, right? Whether it is international, definitely the international standards were kept in mind because BD is having the similar structure to the cigar. If you have, uh, you know, uh, knowledge that cigar is also Korean cigar and, uh, you know, Cuba cigar and a lot many cigars are there. And cigars are having similar kind of structures that they are also not having filters and they're directly exposed and they are also prepared by uh, various kinds of leaves, right? So uh, see, see, similar, this particular study can be directly applied to cigar also. The similar kind of result can be found. So that's why we, are, we have kept that international you know, audience in the target also. But of course, that even US also, people are using BDs. It's not like that. And it is not, I'm not telling that every time you are going to get, get BD from the crime scene. But yes, if, if, if 10 crime scenes are solved based on this particular study, I'd be very happy. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Payal. She says, the evidence on BD has high chances of contamination and destruction due to various reasons. So what all protocols must be followed in such scenarios? So see, whatever the parameters you told that, yes, obviously, environmental factors are going to, you know, uh, work according to their nature. And it is uh, obviously as, uh, as per the degradation uh, principles, the, the DNA on BD is also going to be degraded, obviously. But the main thing with the BD is basically, uh, the amount of cells which are de uh, deposited on the BD is as very high as compared to the cigarette, right? And that's why the quantity of DNA is going to be very high because the coarse surface of the BD, you know, that particular leaf is there, which is getting the more cells into that. And without filter, it is getting even more because the tobacco is directly coming into contact with the saliva. 
so it is there and uh, uh, of course yes it is going to be degraded so uh, as much as possible you have to do and uh, this is a, 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 so that's what the the problem of the you know co extraction of the phenolic compounds co extraction of uh, certain or uh, other organic compounds like tar material and all that and that was a problem and they were potent pcr inhibitors and that's why we proposed this particular cell extraction and then finally you get the dna so this is how we thought of okay so so we have a lot of questions for you the next uh, question yeah. is from gorav he says can the bd be reused for cell extraction can it be used only once or multiple times multiple times i told you that even you are having three components when you are using it uh, you are uh, directly getting three components and i will tell you that uh, after even extraction of the dna the bd stub contain the dna right so uh, you can definitely preserve that you should not uh, you know discard it and definitely it should be the regular protocol that okay after the you know stub is washed and uh, lysed and everything generally people used to discard it the re regular practice is the discarding but we should preserve it so it will give you the dna even second time also okay so next question is from harvard pande sds being a hazard to human health when exposed does it impact the cells to be extracted and to what level uh yeah i told you already in the in the in the uh, you know talk itself that whatever the concentration of sds we have used is very negligible right it's, it's very point you know even 0. 0.00 something uh, molar millimolar and that is only just to you know reduce the surface tension by which the cells are adhered to the bd uh, you know leaves or tobacco material right and uh, whenever you are using such kind of you know stuff then definitely it is not going to be harmful on the cells and we took care of that particular thing because uh, initially when we used a higher concentration of sds the cells uh, were going to rupture and uh, we were not going getting any you know intact cells into the hemocytometer but ultimately uh, the optimum concentration was found by one of the uh, one of our students was optimized and finally we got the results so this is how we we processed okay sir the last one chandrashekhar again asks without using population data some are saying not valid before court sir what do you say for this uh yes you are right that without population data uh, somebody can challenge into the court but whatever the kits which are uh, employed for dna uh, analysis in any any analysis of our country for example it is valid why because those kits are actually uh, validated against uh, global databases or you can say the global populations and which includes samples from india as well right so based on that particular statistical calculations the courts are uh, allowing those particular dna analysis into the court right because uh, it is valid it is it is already validated it is already you can say uh, internal validation external validation and development of validation is that takes it took less and that's why but of course you are right that yes if you are having a population database of our india then definitely it is going to help Uh, no matter uh, even even people are using indian database as well because many uh, population uh, data articles are research articles are available uh, on the databases like pubmed central and many research journals and uh, the forensic scientists are aware of that and they are utilizing those frequency tables and uh, statistics for their internal calculations so that is not a big deal to prove into the court okay sir so the last question is from ratna nicholas she says even though we have a sample of dna but we didn't find perfect matching suspect of the dna how does the case get solved uh if the dna database is not there then definitely it is going to be a cold case right because if you don't have any suspect with you don't you don't have any choice right but yes one more thing can be done because nowadays the extra analysis can be done so you can see if the court is allowing that you can ask for extra analysis of mitochondrial dna so you can go for you know maternal lineage analysis whether it exit the, the 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 origin of that particular thing is in indian or you know uh, african origin or apart from that you can go for phenotypic characteristics which is still you know the advanced technology and still it is debatable whether it is admissible or not uh, in us and europe people have already started uh, you know to admit into the court and uh, many cases were already convicted based on this particular analysis that phenotypic characteristics you can know the hair color eye color of that person if it is not available so based on that you can you can have lead you cannot have you know the complete personal identification but you can have lead okay that you can you know filter the leads 
you can go with this particular things so this is how you can go. i once again thank you so much sir i'm sure your answers must have addressed the doubts of your doubts of our audience thank you very much okay so anything else and i think uh, lunch must be waiting for you or i don't know what is the next but i'm i'm really thankful for the invite and uh, you know uh, giving me the chance to interact with this uh, you know the young minds thank you very much thank you very much once again thank you so sir should i, should I stop sharing yes audience we are looking forward to hear more from you regarding your views on the event the best comments will be awarded with a surprise which will be revealed later at the end of the e event so keep commenting and stay tuned with us moving on to our next national speaker as rightly quoted by paracelsus the father of toxicology all substances are poisons there is none which is not a poison the right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy in the same way the right direction coming from the right person can lead to a pathway filled with immense possibilities one such renowned personality in the field of toxicology that we have amongst us is none other than dr rakhi agarwal ma so ladies and gentlemen i am very much delighted to invite amongst us dr rakhi agarwal ma'am who holds more than 17 years of professional experience including about 12 years of academic experience in the field of toxicology she is currently serving as an associate professor at national forensic sciences university since university inception that is july 2009 she has received many prestigious awards honors and fellowships she has to her credit 27 publications in peer reviewed international as well as national journals one patents and two articles she has guided several research fellows and some fellows have been awarded phd degree from india and overseas she has been working as a reviewer for many journals of elsevier etc she is a life member of various professional bodies in india and a full member of society of toxicology usa today we feel very grateful to gain useful insights from you ma'am for delivering an expert talk titled amalgam of forensic and clinical toxicology need of the art over to you ma'am thanks a lot ashika it's really a privilege and a great opportunity for me uh, to be a people from a group who is um, created by the students and i really congratulate to you prashant nandita and all the entire team like apurva uh, shamek uh, uh, with your all pains that you have taken since last more than a month uh, to get us together so that uh, this platform can be uh, developed this platform can be uh, presented in in front of the each and every one so um, thanks a lot and i am really um, happy and hopeful for my all participants who are going to who are attending this uh, session right now and will listen later on in a future through the youtube channel so uh, first of all congratulate and thanks for providing us this opportunity and this platform um, thank you so uh, without taking much more time uh, i just have a uh, some technical difficulty because i am unable to connect my laptop or the uh system uh, with a uh, university network so this is i am using my own tablet with my own uh, network connectivity so can you give me a 5 minute or 2 to 3 minutes just i connect my ppt and then i can be presented sure ma'am sure okay to mean the time uh, by the time you can please handle it i will just connect it and will be back soon sure yes, ma'am no problem no problem so we have a question for our audience here uh, by the time ma'am connects uh, we can ask this to the uh, audience just imagine you are given a situation where a uh, environmental situation is there and a lot of deaths has been occurred okay so what do you think what is the essential factor that can cause toxicity 
in those individuals who are exposed to a toxic environment, whether it is the dose, the time it was being exposed, or both the factors as a whole with the individual's age. So let's wait for the comments. And guys, I'm waiting for your answers. Let's see uh, who can answer the best and with a good explanation. And do, stay tuned because there are a lot of surprises for you guys. So the best answers, best questions are going to get something valuable and valuable memories to take away. Someone has okay, someone has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Someone has said to repeat the question. Okay. So I'll repeat the question again. Imagine you are, uh, there is a population that is present in a particular environment. Let's consider a country or a state where there is a toxic gas that has been exposed. So what do you think are the factors that can affect the toxicity of that uh, population? How those pe people will be affected? Is it the dose? Is it the amount they are exposed to? Is it the age of the individual or the factors altogether? What is your opinion? And we would also like to hear from you your explanation. So I think ma'am has connected her presentation. We can answer, uh, we can take the answers after the presentation. So guys start commenting the uh, answers to this question. And also yes. ma'am is here now. Thank you, Prashant, for uh, handling the session so far. And uh, it's uh, really a great. So uh, I have already told this, and um, this is the empowering forensic science. And I'm happy to tell you that after the talk, uh, I got a call from our honorable vice chancellor, sir. And he again congratulated to the entire team. And he has sending his uh, wishes for the all participants, and particularly for those who are looking for the uh, going into in the future for the forensic science courses or the programs. So uh, we extend our best wishes to each and everyone, those who are interested to join uh, this in the future. I'm here not audible. Am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Now you're audible. Yes, ma okay, fine. So, um, as for the talk, um, I'm going to present my. Yeah, so this is the amalgam of forensic and clinical toxicology, which is actually a need of the hour. Um, basically, what is forensic science? If you will go through it, so this is uh, the thing that is related to the public. Uh, which is uh, coming into the public discussion uh, that is uh, relevant, more defined the forensic definition, which is relating to used in or suitable to the court of law. And the forensic science is the application of science through criminal and the civil law during the criminal investigation governed by the legal standards of admissible evidences and criminal procedures. So forensic scientists, uh, the term uh, when we uh, focus about the forensic science, so if something unnatural happened, as Dr. Rajesh Prabhu sir told very clearly. So in that situation, we have to investigate that what was the reason for that. And once uh, we identified what was the reason, then we have to know that who did it. So the forensic science starts with the question, what happened? That what happened means what unnatural happened. And afterwards, after that unnatural happening, uh, who is the victim? That is the first thing, which is generally 99.9% uh, .9 cases, which is, uh, which is available. The available thing, which is the missing, uh, the non-available thing or the missing thing is who did it. So who did it means uh, we have to identify the suspect, then we have to identify the culprit. And finally, uh, with the help of the all forensic investigating step, there should be a punishment to the criminal so that the justice can be given. So this is the overall um, scenario or this is the overall motive of the forensic science and particularly the science that is dealing with the scientific application, knowledge or the instrumentation or the technology so that the justice can be provided so that the help can be given to the judicial process 
so that the criminal can be caught and the punishment can be provided. As a result, the society can be the crime free. So this whole responsibility depends upon the forensic scientists. So forensic scientists collect, preserve and analyze the scientific evidences during the course of the investigation. So we people are dealing with the investigating point of view uh, that uh, our duty may be at the uh, crime scene as the, from the slide. Uh, we can uh, have to go to and we have to uh, collect the evidences from there and we can be in the laboratory um, the another role can be the to be in a laboratory to perform the analysis uh, to execute to work with the sample and also as dr bhargav patel sir told that uh, for the development or the latest advancement in the field of the forensic science we need research also so we have to uh, do r and d so that there will be a new methodology, there will be a new type of the technologies through which uh, the criminal or the uh, chain of the custody through which the entire procedure can be established and the criminal can be or suspected can be caught. So this whole is a forensic science uh, where starting uh, we have to find out the answer of the question that what happened and second how it happened. And third, who did it? So this, these are the three questions that we have to uh, have the answers for that. So particularly, uh, if we will talk about the forensic science in a, in a broader way, so these are the thrust area of the forensic science earlier, but with the advantage or uh, with the advantages of the uh, society, technologies, more anthropogenic development, uh, the face of the crime is also changed as uh, our honorable vice chancellor sir told. Now we are moving towards the digital phase. The crime are related to the digital world. There we are not having any paper there we don't have anything that is physically present so that can be happened but basically still now still the cases are related to the such type of the cases and i am particularly focusing on the cases which is directly related to the human body which is directly related to the biological system so on the basis of that there can be the four uh, main thrust area forensic chemical sciences physical sciences biological sciences and the area of the ballistics where we have a firearm cases there we need to analyze the gsr uh, gunshot residues as uh, dr Vy uh, honorable vyas sir included uh, the bullet case firearm cases where he was uh, quoting that uh, bullet uh, can be available at the crime scene or from the victim's body but what about the cartridge? So that is the thing that we have to understand. We have to correlate. So each and every area of the forensic science is very important uh, to solve the crime. So once uh, we will be uh, expert in that field, as the sir said it very clearly, once we will be the expert in a particular specialized field, then only we will be able to uh, to uh, solve that or to give the opinion for a particular case. So as a slide representing, uh, representing that uh, we have a forensic toxicology, environmental and technical toxicology, clinical toxicology, narcotic and psychotropic substances, explosive analysis and chemical adulteration in the case of the forensic chemical area. While uh, forensic biology, it's uh, um, somehow obvious related with the human system, forensic biology and serology, and also the wildlife forensics, forensic odontology related to the dentistry. And forensic physical sciences includes the core area of the forensic fingerprints, document examination, and then again, forensic documents, that is forged documents, soil, painting, glass, polymers, and the fibers, and also the ballistics, that is the GSR. So moving ahead, uh, being a topic uh, related to the topic and also being a forensic toxicologist and looking forward for the uh, area of the forensic uh, the chemistry or the toxicology. So my current topic is uh, more related towards the chemistry and the toxicology, where we have to deal with the substance that is actually can be any chemical or drug. So the difference between the chemical and the drugs, I can understand uh, my audience are aware with that. Uh, here, as uh, in initial, uh, when she was uh, Ashika was introdu introducing me, uh, she quoted the statement of the Paracelsus, where she said that everything can act as a poison, a right dose differentiate a poison from the remedy. So very perfect. So once we will understand the chemicals, and once we understand the chemicals and then drugs, and then only we can understand the poison. If anything which is in higher quantity can be a poison for the human being. 
so yes as she said uh, as uh, she said this is already available here so any substance can be harmful to the living organism if it is uh, admi administered or if it is come in contact to the body uh, with a high dose and actually there is no definition for high dose that depends upon the chemistry of the substance that depends upon the nature of that particular substance so any substance which is maybe in any form solid liquid or gas introduced or brought into the contact with any body part will produce ill health or death can be termed as poison so moving back to the toxicology so toxicology is the fundamental science of poison and this fundamental science of the poison is actually includes each and everything that is the uh, properties dose action symptoms and afterwards is it detection once it is entered into the human system its detection estimation and then after if the survival case is there so how to manage this poisoning case and how to provide treatment to the patient so that life can be saved so here uh, actually in this definition my topic is uh, present um, forensic toxicology because poisoning cases cannot be a natural cases as dr radesh babu sir said as i also told that whatever unnatural happening is there then we have a forensic investigation so poisoning cases can never be a natural cases either they will be uh, accidental suicidal or homicidal thereafter some other type cases are also there miscellaneous cases but normally the poisoning cases can be intentional or unintentional so intentional poisoning cases can come under the category of the homicidal and the suicidal and unintentional can go to the accidental poisoning cases so i will uh, tell uh, where i am uh, telling uh, where i will uh, define the forensic toxicology and the clinical toxicology but this is the basic definition of the toxicology so it is a discipline of science dealing with the poisonous substances which on entering the body of the organism cause disturbance in their normal functioning leading to the harmful effects and most severe of which may be the death of the organism so we have already done so uh, nothing is toxicity is the comparatively mathematically it is the comparative in comparison between the um, uh, uh, intensity of the two substances to produce hazard to the living organism so basically we can say it is the adverse effect that a substance may produce and dose is the amount of the substance that gain access to the body and sufficient to cause toxicity so if you have heard about the a uh, potassium cyanide case so uh, it's a instant poison a pinch of the potassium cyanide is sufficient to kill the person uh, comparatively if we will talk about the mercury chloride poisoning so for a mercury chloride a kilogram quantity is required to kill the person so that is the dose but uh, in which uh, quantity and how much quantity is required to harm someone that depends upon the chemistry of that particular uh, substance as well as its uh, uh, its fate how that uh, substance um, converted into the another uh, bio transformed material that depends upon that particular chemistry we will discuss that also so uh, we, we can say that uh, those make the poison yeah this is true um, particularly if any substance uh, like if you will consider any uh, tablet or the drug that uh, um, we used to take during our ill health situation that may be a simple paracetamol that may be a aspirin uh, that if we are taking in our ill health situation or not well situation then it is okay it's not a poison but if we are fine and we are taking it so this may act as a poison second thing uh, if we need only one tablet or 650 mg but uh, if a uh, double quantity or triple or four or multiple uh, doses has been taken so this will be poisonous so the same thing and apparently known non toxic chemical can be toxic at high dose or highly toxic chemical can be a life saving when given in appropriate dose depending upon the host condition so the important is here the host condition and for an example we can have the morphine poisoning case or the morphine treatment in case of the advanced cancer stage uh, where uh, the morphine is given to the patient so that there can be a pain relief because uh, morphine is one of the most potent analgesic so once we understood the uh, toxicology so we have to correlate uh, the toxicology with forensic science so forensic toxicology is the 
medical legal aspect of harmful substance effects of any substance in a living organism so that living organism can be the animal or the human beings so it involves the medical aspects that is the diagnosis and the treatment of the harmful effects of the poisoning and legal aspects is the information pertaining to the cause of the poisoning case so both of them can provide the knowledge can provide the, the information through which the case can be solved so medical aspect important for particularly for the survival cases where the patient is survived and uh, we have to treat it we have to save the life so that's why i'm saying this is the need of the hour where the forensic toxicologist as well as the doctors should uh, work together not even the forensic toxicologist i'll say broadly the toxicologist and the doctors should work together because uh, the doctor the, uh, the toxicologist have a knowledge about the sign and the symptoms about the fate of the substance inside the body and they can understand and how to separate it how to manage the poisoning case and what type of the antidote can be good for the patient but for the medical fraternity for the doctors or for the clinical people those are aware with particularly symptomatic treatment they are uh, well uh, able they are well expert uh, for the treatment of the patient as per their symptoms so if the diagnosis is proper and then treatment will be proper then the life can be saved so that's why i am seeing the forensic toxicology and clinical toxicology are the need of the hour they they should work together and uh, the government are looking forward uh, in this area so that the poisoning cases can be uh, handled by the toxicologist and treated by the doctors this uh, process is already going on so is the application of science and the study of the poison to the elucidation of the questions that occur in judicial proceedings it is the science of detecting and identifying the presence of the drug and the poisons in the body fluids tissue and organs so um, normally in forensic toxicology the quantity should is not required but basically the qualitative and the quantitative analysis of drug or the poison in the biological specimen collected at the crime scene and during autopsy so collected at the crime scene that may be uh, the urine that may be the stool material that may be the vomit stuff apart that uh, from the crime scene the traces of the food uh, the remains of the drinking material as well as the some wrappers uh, some uh, tablets anything uh, which has been Place. and in that situation the entire body will be available for the uh, estimation or the detection point of view so during autopsy uh, all visceral tissues and biological fluids can be collected uh, particularly uh, if there will be any idea about the poisoning case or from the uh, during um, inter um, inter interrogation or during uh, the question answering session if there will be a doubt of anything or uh, like there may be a case of the prolonged drug uh, use or prolonged any metal poisoning case so in that situation the long bones the hairs the nails can also be collected during autopsy so what was the role first uh, when the autopsy done and the sample received at the forensic science laboratory so uh, the role of the forensic toxicologist to, uh, to investigate the case both uh, in the survival stage like uh, when the person administered something maybe by self or by someone else and at the time what was the case history what was and uh, what was the problem that was encountered uh, what was the chain of uh, event that recorded at that time so that all and as well as if death occurred so during post mortem uh, what informations are available in the uh, post mortem report so that all should be uh, thoroughly studied checked so that uh, the person who is analyzing who is now going to analyze the sample will be able to interpret the results properly so in that situation for the interpretation of the findings the physiological effects at the time of death if near and dear people were uh, there at that time they were attending the victim so what is their statement about the physiological effect as well as the behavioral effects of the victim 
what is uh, mentioned in the um, case history, what is mentioned in the FIR that is important to understand and so that the results can be uh, interpreted with a correlation, fine, with a correlative study. So this is the most important task and I can say this is the most crucial task for the forensic toxicologist uh, to uh, correlate the case with the uh, available information as well as with the instrumental findings. So uh, this is uh, particularly lorry to the poison and here I want to say uh, that in the law there is no particular definition for poison. Any substance, any substance which is not good for that particular person can act as a poison. So I can say uh, injection of the insulin can act as a poison if it has been given and food has not been provided to the person who is in hyperglycemia condition. Uh, similarly, uh, excessive salt can act as a poison, even excessive water can act as a poison. So anything which is in high quantity can be act, can act as a poison. So there is no particular definition in our uh, law uh, in the section of 284, 299, 3048, 324 and 328 of IPC deal with the office relating to the administration of the poisonous substances and intention is an important element in any act. So if uh, there is an intention, that's why I said either the case can be intentional poisoning or unintentional poisoning. Unintentional poisoning, so there was no motive. There was no modus operandi. But in case of the intentional poisoning, there is a, there is a modus operandi. There is some motive. Uh, that can be the homicidal, that can be the suicidal. So acute definition of poison is not uh, required in uh, law. Administration of any substance with the intention of causing injury or death and which cause injury or death is legally sufficient for awarding punishment. Whether the substance is one can be called poison or not, it's not required. So um, multiple dose of the paracetamol, any simple crocin or anything else. If person is now after the administration of that, after the administration of 10 to 20 uh, tablets, the person is not uh, uh, well now. So that drug can be called as a poison for that particular case. So the law does not make any difference between the murder by mean of the poison or murder by any other mean. So now moving ahead, particular poisoning cases. So this is a very simple representation that you people can also understand. Uh, the first uh, figure showing about the uh, any uh, mass uh, food poisoning case or something, uh, some buffet, something is going on. And that food may be contaminated uh, with any uh, chemical or there may be a microbial growth. So we can say this can be the food poisoning case or poisonous food case. Both the things can occur, can happen. As a result, there is a mass poisoning occur. And uh, this is the, uh, if no intention is there in this first case, then we can say this is the accidental poisoning case. Uh, this second case is somehow representing a lady which is in his of, in her office and uh, have a cup of tea or something. And uh, afterwards, uh, she uh, is, is in this situation. So uh, this case can be generally uh, in a first sight uh, as can be interpreted in terms of the homicidal poisoning case because something is added in this cup and uh, she uh, took it and she is not. No, not, not uh, well now. She's no more now. So uh, such type of the cases can giving a direct clue because uh, this is the intentional poisoning case because she is in a proper way uh, to her office and this tragedy happened. This uh, um, picture is just simply showing the mode of action or the mode of administration of any substance that can be injected. So here you can see these two are for the oral route of administration. This can be the injection route of the administration where the substance can be injected to the body system. And here, uh, this is again um, the poison substance is there, which is administered with this uh, sip um, in the glass. Uh, some uh, traces are already available, so that can be investigated for the detection. So this is the few just uh, diagrammatic representation that uh, the poisoning cases can be occur in this way. So uh, once such type of the cases occur, so being a forensic toxicologist, we have to analyze the cases in the forensic science laboratory. And for that first, we need the case history. The entire case history as well as the uh, authority letter from the um, from the uh, court that this particular laboratory is uh, now uh, assigned for this particular case. And uh, that thorough case study is uh, most important 
so that the proper um, results can be or the interpretation can be done in a correct way so here i say that first of all the first task is to the separation of the poison and second task will be the screening or the identification of the poison so here we can differentiate the qualitative determination and the quantitation qualitative determination are generally and most of the cases are required in forensic toxicology there we just have to tell whether the poison is present or not and if it is present then which poison is present in how much quantity it is present it is not required uh, because uh, if it is 1 mg or it is 100 mg or it is 1 kg does not matter if there was a wrong intentional so uh, if uh, the 1 kg is sufficient if, if the 1 mg is sufficient to harm the person and the case is reported case is filed and it is now in um, uh, fsl then this is sufficient for the punishment or this is sufficient for the next action so quantitation is not required but yes uh, in toxicological studies generally in toxicological studies the quantitation is required in clinical toxicology where we have to treat the patient so how that i will go with the next slides so once this analysis is done then after the toxicological interpretation is the key factor uh, where we have to correlate the findings with the case history and then after with the help of them we have to prepare the report so here i want to give the one example like uh, uh, in terms of the there is a one area of the forensic pharmacology there we have to understand uh, the biotransformation of uh, parent compound which is administered into its biotransformed form or it, into its the metabolic products so as we are aware that uh, whatever entered into the body it's uh, uh, breakdown into its simple or smallest molecular form so similarly uh, once uh, any substance for an example um, if as i as i mentioned uh, the um, morphine so you people are must be aware that di uh, heroin is the diacetyl derivative of the morphine so if heroin is administered so first it break down into the morphine so as a result from the blood uh, we can get the presence of the morphine rather than heroin if the heroin is administered so uh there will be a two type of the results from the crime scene evidences from the circumstantial evidences the report will be positive for the heroin however from the blood examination or the urine examination the report may be present for the morphine so there we should know before the preparation of the report we have to know about this conversion about this forensic pharmacology and that is i call the toxicological interpretation so that the proper report can be presented we can't change the report as we can't say that uh, heroin was detected from the blood or the urine we have to say that heroin was presented from the um, we can't we should say that morphine was presented from the blood and the urine sample however from the crime scene the heroin was presented and as the morphine is converted as the heroin is converted into the morphine that's why uh, in the blood sample we are getting morphine positive results for morphine so that is the presentation of report where we have to cite the proper literature proper references so that uh, the interpretation can be perfect so this is one way and this is one of the uh, example where i want to tell that a lady found dead in his in her room and the numerous medicines were obtained from the uh, from her room so uh, few amounts uh, she has been uh, administered and uh, the stomach contained and the 3 ml blood was collected for the autopsy and from the stomach content actually uh, so stomach content the important thing is here that uh, stomach content will have the as such drug it will no bio transformed product as i you know, told you once the substance entered into the body it's uh, bio transformed that it is converted into its smallest form but stomach content will have the as such compound yes blood will have the bio transformed compound so as the case was found immediately so or uh, the severity of the uh, poison was this much that the entire compound was not bio transformed because uh, two compounds amitriptyline and non triptyline were detected from the stomach content and these two drugs are this in having the synergistic effect so they immediately cause hypoxia in the body as a result the death occur so uh, these two drugs can be uh, was detected from the stomach content not from the blood that's why i am telling you 
So now moving ahead, uh, the clinical toxicology. So clinical toxicology includes expertise in case of the poison information, applied toxicology and medical toxicology. Poison information there, we should know each and every uh, basic and the advanced uh, thing of the poison. So I can say simply the chemistry and the biochemistry of the substance, because either the chemical, either the substance can be chemical in nature, whether naturally occurring or uh, man-made synthesized compound, or it can be the biochemical, biochemical in terms of the animal poison or the plant poison. So every information must be aware must be known to the person and afterwards in under the category of the applied toxicology that means how this uh, poison is entering into the body and afterwards what is its mechanism of the toxicity and what is its fate how it is converting into its another compound so in uh, toxicology generally we have four concepts we have the concept first active compound to deactive compound. So actually this is the normal uh, physiology and you people are nowadays, we are uh, listening it uh, in terms of the current pandemic situation, immune system. And I'll say the detoxification system as well. So uh, this is the capacity of the body to detoxify the substance. So how a particular substance can be unactive or inactive with the help of the our own uh, detoxification mechanism of the body. So this is the active to inactive. Another can be active to active and next can be the inactive to inactive and the most severe can be inactive to active. So that inactive to active is sometimes more uh, problematic because the compound itself is not so toxic as in the earlier uh, slide we can see amitriptyline and nortriptyline individually are not uh, so much toxic or fatal. Same, same example we can take for this uh, uh, sleeping pills and the alcohols. If sleeping pills and alcohols are taken together, so that can be the fat. So that will the under the applied toxicology where the interactive studies of new substance can also be gone and where the how the compound can enter and how it is biotransformed and how it is producing toxicity will also be noted. And medical toxicology includes the treatment. So where uh, the proper medication, where the proper therapies that should be applied. So that are uh, listed down. So first of all, the stabilization of the patient, that is the management of the poisoning cases. And then after the clinical Evolution. So that clinical evolution is most important and it is correlated can it this can be correlated with the forensic toxicology. Uh, as I said in my previous slide, the quantitation. So there I will tell you in the with one example later on slide. So clinical evolution with the help of the history, uh, physical and laboratory and radiological examination, then prevention of the further toxic absorption. So uh, we are aware with the ADME process until unless the substance will not be absorbed, the toxicity will not be too problematic. So we have to stop the absorption and we have to accelerate the elimination of the substance and simultaneously whatever substance is entered into the scenario into the body and converted. So we have to give a proper treatment for that sometimes in the form of the antidote and whatever the supportive care that can be provided according to the symptoms and the chemistry of the substance. So this is one of the example uh, where the accidental propoxer. Propoxer is obtained from the, uh, propoxer is the pesticide. Yeah. So propoxer bacon, uh, which is a carbamate compound, is a non-synthetic insecticide. And it is highly toxic, but it is still used and uh, as a mechanism of the toxicity, uh, it uh, sees or it depletes the blood chlorine esterase activity. So this case was happened and I particularly um, attached with this case. So in this situation, what happened? Uh, the illicit liquor, the um, homemade alcohol was um, kept in a container which was earlier used for the collection of the propoxa or the bagon, that is the insecticide for the farming area, agriculture field. But this was not aware by the people who kept that there. So accidentally, the alcohol was contaminated with propoxa and when this alcohol was administered by the people so they found uh, some unhealth issues they found some uh, illness condition and similarly 21 victims were uh, noted and they were 
hospitalized they were treated and out of them the three um, total three deaths were occur and uh, rest of the people were survived because uh, initially the case was looking for the propoxer poisoning but uh, uh, sorry initially the case was looking for the uh, methanol poisoning because uh, the liquor was uh, homemade liquor so in homemade liquor there is a most of the chances that there may be a methanol contamination but from the gchs analysis it was confirmed that methanol is not present in the sample so after Afterwards, the GCMS analysis was done, and with the help of the library, uh, the propoxer was detected. And from the whole blood sample of the all the victims, the propoxer was uh, detected, and the proper treatment was provided to them. So why I am telling this case was uh, encountered, this case was reported, this case was came to the forensic science laboratory because of the illicit liquor poisoning. But during investigation by the forensic expert, it was found that this is not the illicit liquor because this is not the methanol. poisoning case this is something else so later on in the chemistry department it was investigated is what detected with the presence of the propoxer and after was the symptomatic treatment and proper antidote was provided to the patient so that the life was saved so as i said the methanol poisoning case so methanol poisoning case is one of the most important case in case where we have a amalgam of the forensic toxicology as well as the clinical toxicology so methanol poisoning actually um, there is a enzymatic system in the body which helps for the bio transformation so methanol converts into the bio finally it's formic acid and this formic acid produces ocular toxicity as well as the general toxicity as well as the uh, fatal it can be the fatal depending upon the dose so this is the entire mechanism uh, that as i told here uh, from the applied toxicology so that can be a part of this applied toxicology where we have to understand the mechanism of the action that how the substance is producing toxicity what are the basic steps what are the various steps where it happened so if we want to treat the patient so we have to break this system so that the methanol will not convert into the formic acid and for that this is the slide which i got from the um, you know internet very quickly i got it so uh, in methanol poisoning as i can say was was uh, um, i can see um, during uh, my own experience that ethanol can act as a poison because the uh, whatever this antidote that is fomipizolol is inhibiting the alcohol dehydrogenase this is the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase which convert methanol into the formaldehyde which is toxic and further the aldehyde dehydrogenase is also converted this formaldehyde into the formic acid which is further more toxic so there as i said to you uh, there are the four ways in the toxicology active to active active to inactive inactive to inactive and inactive to active so this class this example is the case of the inactive to active where methanol itself is not poison but yes its bio transformed compound are severely toxic it leads to the cns depressant metabolic acid acidosis uh, neurological dysfunction burning complete loss of vision coma respiratory failure and death depending upon the dose never forget depending upon the dose this is the order where the severity of the effects are increasing so uh, this particular antidote what it do or the, what the alcohol can do it inhibit the alcohol dehydrogenase uh, function and alcohol actually is a, a pharmacological antidote for methanol so in case of the alcohol the kind the transfer of the kinetic uh, um, kinetic transfer from ethanol to acid acetaldehyde is faster than methanol so in that situation the alcohol dehydrogenase what is present in the body is uh, used by the ethanol and as a parallelly uh, in a medical hospital in a hospital the uh, dialysis hemodialysis uh, go ahead so that uh, this methanol can be flushed out from the body further the conversion can be stopped so um, here being a forensic scientist when the case was encountered Uh, being a forensic toxicologist the case come to the laboratory there we have to investigate and uh, what is the present but if this is a survival case so parallelly we need to treat the patient so in that situation the 
chem clinical toxicologist and um, forensic toxicologist join hand together and they can save the life if proper investigation was going on and the proper knowledge is available to each and every department so as per the clinical toxicology the treatment can be provided and for the uh, forensic toxicology the investigation can be done in a proper way so that the, which type of the poison is present in the body can be tell to the people so uh, this is the one example um, where uh, this is the our ongoing research in the laboratory where um, the benzene is one of the very potent carcinogenic compound and it is having the high anthropogenic activity so uh, this is related to the clinical toxicology as well as the environmental toxicology where the development of the latest advanced technology can save the life can uh, develop a better uh, system human system there we can avoid uh, such chemicals there we can have some substitute so in this uh, the regular monitoring or the detection of the benzene exposed to population can be carried out with the help of the sophisticated instrument so that uh, we can uh, reduce the chances of the risk of their poisoning with any toxic substance this is just one example but with any toxic substances that are having the high anthropogenic activities so thank you so much now this is about all my talk and uh, if you have any question that you can raise please Thank you very much, ma'am, for sharing your deep knowledge about the topic. I'm very much sure that the audience must have enjoyed your talk. And uh, we have uh, many questions that we have received from the audience, uh, from both national and international. So because of the time constraints, uh, I would just like to ask you, ma'am, one question. Uh, it, it is from Sneha Narayan. Uh, she says, let's suppose a person takes a drug in large doses as a suicidal attempt but coincidentally also faces a toxic gas exposure. So can both the incidents be differentiated during toxicology test? Yes, it can be differentiated. As you said, uh, something is administered orally. So the channel will be the esophagus then stomach and then liver, kidney and the brain. So proper detection technique, uh, first of all, proper separation technique can extract the poison from the tissues. And second instance, you are telling about the inhalation of the poisoning gas. So that inhalation through the lungs. So from the lungs or from that way, if the proper fate of the poisoning is known or aware. So yes, that can be differentiated with a different route of administration. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. I hope that uh, your answer must have addressed the doubt of Sneha. And uh, also, I would request that the, uh, like for all the audience, we will be answering your questions in the valedictory sessions. Yeah. And our respected audience, uh, we are really glad that you have, are commenting tremendously right now. I can see a lot of comments right now that are uh, flowing through the comment section. So the question that you asked earlier, that uh, which all factors will be affecting the toxicity of environmental poisoning. So yeah, a lot of people have answered correctly, like Hemani, Priyanka, Utkarsh Kopta, Dr. Kokila, and uh, we have Dr. Barberi ma'am, and a lot of people, means the list is just not ending. So guys, that's amazing for your active participation. And right now we will be ending our session one, because uh, uh, session two will be starting within an hour, half an hour. That is at 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. So stay updated and continuously participated, uh, continue to participate in our comment sections because uh, your comments are being noted down by our teams and the best comments will be getting surprises at the end of the event. So stay tuned. And for the session two, the link will be provided uh, on the YouTube. So we are looking forward to your active participation and thank you our wonderful audience our respected faculty members the national forensic sciences university reputed experts and all the other experts that are present with us at the zoom meeting and the forensic corner and the uh, forensic corner team thank you so much for the session one we may now conclude Okay, so on behalf of the whole team of the Forensic Corner, I would like to thank uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Dr. J.M. Gas, Sir, Campus Director, Sir, Dr. Esu Janari, Sir, and all the esteemed faculty members of our National Forensic Sciences University, Dr. Rakhi Agarwal, Ma'am, 
Dr. Bhargav Patel sir and Dr. Rajesh Babu sir for giving their valuable time and for addressing each and every one of us. I uh, so that's it for us and uh, hope to see you again for the session two at four to six p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you, everyone. So, see you soon. Take care. Bye.